Hello everyone, I'm Michael Wozniak and I'm pleased to co-host this masterclass with Nathalie de Marsay. Hi everyone, our special guest today is Mr. John Laval. He is the president of the Society of Neurolinguistic Programming. He is specialized in business and he's co-training with Dr. Richard Bandler and Kathleen Laval. And he's also the author of uh, the book Persuasion Engineering. If you need to know anything more about us, just see the links be uh, beneath and uh, you can find our websites. Now, since 20% um, of the people who registered don't know what NLP is, John, we are going to begin with the first, um, uh, well, no, 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 before that. Yeah, I, before that, let, let's, yeah, let's, let's give let's, some numbers. Okay. Absolutely. So, so, so just for all of you to know, um, there are about 1,700 people who registered, so 1,700 people uh, from 57 countries. So we received more than a thousand questions and Natalie did a great job synthesizing and compiling them. And so just before we start, subscribe to the channel because we are going to answer as many questions as possible. If not during this masterclass, but afterwards, also in the next, uh, in the coming weeks, we're going to create some videos to answer many of those questions. This channel is content oriented and we will bring a lot of value to anyone interested in NLP and also in strategies. So there is one French channel. This is the one on which you are now. And I also created an English channel that you will find in the description of the video just below where we will post the same contents in English. So if you are more familiar with English, just subscribe to the English channel that is referenced below. Okay. Also, during the whole masterclass, feel free to comment during the live. We are going to keep track of your comments. Be constructive and we will offer answers. If not live, we'll answer after the event in that series of videos that we're going to announce also to you. So we'll publish in French on the French channel and in English on the English channel. Yay! So, as I was... Are you ready, John, to get on the grill? <laughs> yes. Um, hello, everybody. Hello, hello, hello out there. Super. So the first question is um, from Laila from, from France, who asks, in a few words, what would be a clear and striking definition of NLP? Very simple. Uh, NLP is about how the brain works and works along with language as well as uh, neurochemistry, of course, but most people miss that point. And so, uh, and NLP has been around for a long, long time. Uh, while there's a lot of things we can do with it, I'm gonna give you how I figure out for people the best way to describe the two parts of NLP for them. One is that, first of all, there's two parts to the entire technology. First, there are the basic skills. And those skills, by the way, there are no new skills that I can think of or that anybody's come up with. Somebody might call them new skills, but in fact, they're not. We have the language patterns, you know, okay? We have the, you know, anchoring things like this. These are sets of skills. And when you take those skills and you put them together, those comprise techniques. So the techniques, by the way, while they work, and I tell people the following thing, they're gonna work every single time until the first time they don't. So if you teach techniques, then you're not teaching skill. You've got to teach the skills in order for the techniques to really work just about most of the time. Because if something doesn't go down right, you know, you're working with someone or whatever, and all of a sudden it's not, you're not reaching the result. If you have the skills, you can quickly figure out what to do next. Basically, it's about how the brain works and with language. Remember, it's neuro-linguistic programming. And my favorite part is the one in the middle, the linguistics. So neuro, about brain, that includes, by the way, neurochemistry, which most people don't teach, but we've been teaching it since the 90s. Linguistics for the language part and programming basically means how do we organize our thoughts? How do we organize our strategies? You know, things that get us through everyday life. Actually. So 
Excellent. Thank you, John. So the, the next question, which is very connected to the first one, is also is from Paul. And he's asking, how can you reprogram yourself to achieve success? Uh, let, me, let me say a couple of things about that, Paul. First of all, NLP was not really, you know, people call it a self-help technology. It was never a self-help technology. It was really meant to work with other people, to help other people get the results they want in their lives, okay? Now, can you go in and reprogram yourself? Probably, but that, that, that means you've got to live the technology, not just try to run programs and, and do things inside, inside your own mind with techniques. Will they work for you? They could. The best way to be able to get programmed for success is to work with someone because the most difficult thing about working with yourself is you can't calibrate yourself. If you studied NLP at all, okay, you understand about it and, and how you have to, you know, basically observe the other person for changes, okay, and just even looking at my, my part of my body from here up, you're not going to see everything, you know, so if you were working with me, you can't see my foot move, you can't see my hands move, so, but the other person, when you work with the other person, if they're, if they're well-trained in NLP, they know how to calibrate you, uh, they could see a finger twitch, and that could mean something, and they could check it out. Maybe it means something. So the program yourself, the best, the only way I know about programming yourself, and, and this is going to sound a little bit weird, is to change your environment and put yourself in an environment, or the environment where all there is is success. You know, work with people, hang out with people, talk with people, have coffee with people who are successful. And you can glean some of those things by being with those people. So by changing your environment, Putting yourself in a very successful environment really, really helps. You know, I've been very fortunate in my life. And so people say, you know, I only know a lot about business because I've got a lot of experience in business. I got an MBA in business. You know what I learned? I learned how to get an MBA in business. That's it. Okay. Most of the things I learned in, in, uh, in, in, in my MBA program, I don't ever remember using at all. Okay. But I started out when I was young. I, I, I didn't know the word entrepreneur at the time, um, but I started my own little business. You know, I was probably about 13 years old. I won't tell you what it was. It wasn't illegal, but I'll, I'll go past that part. And then um, I, get, I had to get a job. My father said, no, no, listen, you know, that's a summer job. Now you get a real job. So I got a paper route that lasted a month because I said, I'm not going to hold newspapers around and wait to get paid for the newspapers and things, delivering them. And then uh, I got a, a job at an ice cream place, okay? I don't know if you have those kind of places over there, but the, the, the name of it anyway over here, it's called Carvel. So, and they make soft ice cream and things like that. So I did that job. Now, the guy who, um, who owned the place, um, he was a real pain in the neck, okay? However, he taught me a lot of things. And I remember these things. So, and he stayed on me, you know, and I was like, oh, I'd go home every night going, oh, this guy, bye. I can't work for this guy. Blah, blah. So, but anyway, I, I realized that I was learning some things and he was teaching me things, not just about making ice cream, but about quality, business, running a business, things like this. Um, then I, I, you know, I ended up going, I went to school, college and everything else and worked for a couple of different companies. And I worked in every every part of a company you could think of except for uh, accounting and finance. Okay. I wasn't just interested in, in doing accounting inside the company, but I worked in human resources. I'm going to work my way back when human resources, quality control, manufacturing, logistics, transportation, all of these things. And I was fortunate and I continue to say, I was very, very fortunate to learn because of my experience and the people who decided to mentor me. Um, a few executives, they just, they just took a liking to me. I just, I just still don't know why, but they taught me things. Okay. They take me on, they take me aside and go, listen, I know you did this thing on this project. You know, you might want to consider this the next time, blah, 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 you know? And uh, so my experience, but the other thing I realized was that I put myself in a different environment than, than what I had at home. My dad worked hard. He was a factory worker. So the people he knew and the people he hung out with were factory workers. I remember going to bowling one night. He said, he said, son, come on, I'm going to go bowling with the team. I said, all right, I must have been 10 years old. And they talked about the management and the supervisors and they were drinking beer while they were talking. And that was all okay, except I wasn't really learning anything. 
And, and that was okay. Cause I was with my dad and his friends, but I realized that if I was going to be in a, if I wanted to learn more things, I had to be in the environment. So I, first thing I did was put myself in the environment to be successful. Now I do, I consider myself to have been very fortunate or lucky, let's say lucky, but I found that luck is a combination of good skill and being in the right place at the right time and recognizing their opportunities there. So put yourself in a different environment. Go hang out with people who are successful. You know, go, go make friends with them and go to meetings with them and things like this. So that's, that's one way to do it. Instead of trying to program yourself for success because you can trick yourself into doing the wrong thing anyway because you can't calibrate yourself. You know, you could be doing something in your mind and thinking this, this, this. And uh, meanwhile, that's part of your conscious mind. So what you're aware of is going to be your conscious mind. What you're not aware of is what's going on in your unconscious mind. And your unconscious mind may not like what you're doing, and you may not know it, which means you don't end up being successful. So you can fool your unconscious mind basically by putting yourself in the environment with successful people. If you keep if you keep hanging around with the people who are pretty much you know at the same success level, let's say as you are, remember you're going to be talking to yourself about things you're talking to them about. You're hearing them talk about things, but it's all at the same level that you're all at. But if you start hanging around with people who are already successful, okay, and they're out there, and they're more than happy to help out, I'm sure that I'm sure they are. I don't care what country you're in, you just have to get them talking about themselves and things like that, you know. And uh, you you have a better chance of programming yourself for success. NLP is not just about NLP is not just about techniques. Like I said, it's not just about techniques. And you probably have a whole lot of questions here about techniques. Um, and I'm going to be the first one to tell you, there are some techniques that I, you know, I'll say, well, here, you can try this technique out. Um, you've got to live NLP. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. So part of that means hang out with people who are successful and glean what you can from them about how they got to be successful and what are they doing to stay successful? Um, because then that's the best way of getting it into your brain, your life. You, you know, we, we, we live, I live NLP. I'm pretty sure I do. Um, that doesn't mean I do everything perfectly every day. It means I do make mistakes. I know when I make a mistake and I put something in my brain so that I go, oh, I have to do this differently the next time. And I might not even know what to do the next, the next time. But I do recognize I made a mistake as soon as I make it, at least usually. So hang out with people who are successful. Find out what happens. That's really a way to, way to do it. You might find out that some of them decide that they like you and they will mentor you as well. You just don't know. They'll be the best. They'll be the best success programmers that you can find. That was a little bit of a long answer there, but uh. that was amazing. Now we have uh, Dalila from uh, France, who wants to know how to communicate about the benefits of NLP to people who don't believe in it. Uh, oh, how to how to how to convince them, basically. How Yeah, but basically, how uh, how to communicate the, the benefits of, of the benefits. NLP? Okay, real, real short, simple answer. Yeah. Give, them, give them an experience of it. It's very hard. Even Richard cannot really explain and describe NLP. I heard people ask more times. So, so uh, what, what's NLP? He goes, listen, I I came up with a name. I had discovered all these different things that work. Um, I don't even know how to how to tell you you know, what is it and how to convince you of it. But I knew years ago that the best way, here's the deal. You can talk to somebody and you can explain all kinds of things to them. Okay. Regardless of how sincere you are and how much you love the technology, they're not going to necessarily get it up here. They're just not going to get it up here. Okay. The best way to convince someone of something is to give them an experience of it. Okay. I'm going to give you a fast example. Uh, it has to do with me. Back years ago when I was doing, I was working with Richard, and, but I was not training, co-training with him just yet. And he said to me, I was doing, uh, I was staffing with him for him, you know, doing groups, group, small group sessions during the trainings. And he said to me, hey, hey John, I hear you're doing pretty well with, uh, you know, language patterns and things. I go, well, I, I don't know, I guess, you know. And he said, well, how about you get on, the, and this, this is a rare opportunity when Richard does this. Well, how about you take the microphone this afternoon and teach some language patterns? And I thought, uh oh, oh no, this, man, this, oh boy. I said, well, Richard, I said, that, that's good. Yeah, but you know, can I do it tomorrow? Because, you know, I want, I want to brush up a little bit and everything else. And I'm thinking in my mind, I'm going to read my books tonight. 
I'm going to study all this stuff. And uh, he said, oh, yeah, sure. Okay, so you want to do it tomorrow? I said, yeah, that'd be great. He said, okay, tomorrow after lunch? I said, yeah, that'd be great. He gets up after lunchtime, grabs the microphone and says, now John Laval's going to come up and teach language patterns. One up here, John. Well, that was on the same day. That was only minutes after he said, yeah, sure, no problem, John. I'll let you do it tomorrow. He threw me right in there with the sharks, basically. So that experience, more than anything else, taught me that I learned what I learned. Let me start with that. Okay, so the best way to do it is to give someone an experience for NLP. Now, you might wonder, well, like what? What do you mean? So it's very simple. If somebody comes in, they're, they're complaining about, oh, you know, I'm having a bad day, blah, blah, blah. I go right to submodality just to give them an experience of it. Now, I know a lot of people, they, you know, people, a lot of people, they, 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 they down talk about submodality. They go, oh, that's bad. Everything's submodalities. Well, let me tell you about submodalities. It's the way that we encode the information. It's not even the final encoding. We can change the coding, okay? We can change the way we coded something. In other words, if you had an experience with a dog and you, and, and you didn't like the dog, you know, the dog frightened you or whatever, you're going to have images and sounds inside your mind and feelings that go with them in a certain coding. Now, maybe the picture's in black and white. Maybe it's a still shot. I don't know. Maybe the sound is real loud in your, in your head and the feeling is like, Ugh, you know? Well, I just look and I go, wait, 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 excuse me. Here, here, why don't you try this? And I have them shift their submodalities right there. And by the way, I could be sitting in an airport. I don't really care where I am. Okay. I had a woman sitting on an airplane once. She sat next to me. And as she sat and sat in the chair, we call the white knuckle rider. She was so tense grabbing onto the, the armrests and her and her, 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 her hands were white from, from grabbing on so hard. I looked at her and I said, are you okay? And she said, no. And I said, everything, I mean, what's up? She goes, I hate flying. I just, I'm afraid this plane is going to crash. And she's making all these pictures in her head about this stuff, th things that aren't going to happen necessarily, right? And I said to her, I said, can I help you with that? And she said, sure, that'd be, that'd be great. She goes, well, I don't know what you, can, what, you, what you can do. And I just, you know, I chided her a little bit. And I said, well, you know, you make pictures in your head. And she said, what? You know how many times they get that response from people? They say, what? I go, you're making pictures in your head. And she does this thing. Oh, yeah, you're right. I go, stop making those pictures, make better pictures, and then calm down a little bit, you know? And she said, oh, well, how do I calm down? I said, listen, you can calm down a bunch of different ways. Start by changing the images, because those are the ones that are driving what you're feeling right now, okay? So I give people an experience for it. There are some people who come and say, oh, that NLP doesn't work. Well, I got, I got news for them, all right? The thing is, if it, if, it doesn't, if it didn't work, they probably saw an operator or a programmer, I like to call them programsters, that didn't do everything they could do, okay? Um, that people go, you know, we get tested all the time. We get, we get checked all the time. You know, people say, so, uh, okay, so you're, uh, so you're a master trainer, huh? So, uh, so show me how you walk on water. That's a stupid thing. But we, but we I mean, and I'm over, I'm over exaggerating it, but the fact is, that's what happens. So I never take on a challenge, okay? I never take on a challenge. If somebody says, we proved to me that it works, I go, I don't have to prove to you that it works. I can, but I'm not going to because you're challenging it. See, the other thing that goes on that most people aren't, really aren't aware of, unless they've come you know, out with us, is neurochemistry. We teach about neurochemistry. We don't go in depth with it. But you know what? Your brain fires off all kinds of neurotransmitters. they good ones, not so good ones. And those things are important to understand and to recognize at least. You know, so for example, if someone would come in, like the woman, I saw her sitting next to me and I looked at her and I could tell there was something not right. You know, she was very uncomfortable. She's breathing heavy, you know, all this stuff, you know, and, and her, her hands, especially, I saw her hands on the, on the, uh, you know, the arms of the chair. And, uh, and that told me there's something not right here. And therefore something needs to change. I was also thinking, cause I was starting to make some pictures in my own head and here we are, I'm sitting next to this woman who's terrified and we're going to take off on this plane. And when we're in the air, she's going to go, ah! And I don't have no idea what she's going to do. And I don't want to be sitting next to her when this happens. So I either got to change my move, move my seat, which is not going to happen, or I could change her state. And I chose to change her state and to teach her a couple of things. We had a great flight, by the way. It was about a three hour flight. And she said to me, wow, this is really okay. I'm doing okay. And I said, great. She goes, what do you do? Now that's a tough question. I said, well, actually I do whatever I want to do. And my favorite thing to do is one of two things. One is to help people. And two is to help people make money, okay? Those are my two favorite things to do. Help people have a good life and to help people make money. And she said, wow, 
well, well what do you, uh, where'd you go to school? I go, that's not important because I didn't learn how to do this in school. So give someone an experience of NLP because here's the deal. They can, when you're speaking with them and trying to convince them, all of that comes under the category of this is your opinion, okay? And no one actually has to consider your opinion, period. But the other thing is they cannot, I'll repeat that, people cannot deny their own experiences, period. So give them an experience that they just cannot deny, period, done. It's, it's easy enough to do. You don't mm-hmm. have to sit down. You don't have to swing a watch in front of their eyes, you know, do the hypnosis thing like that. You don't have to do all of that. Very conscious, very conscious. I, I, a lot of, I do the unconscious parts when I can, of course, you know, but I, I do what I can, you know, I do what I can to just do it consciously with them. And here's the reason why. Because I've heard people, I've heard other people training and they say, oh, don't worry about it. They go, students say, I, I don't get it. They go, don't worry about it. Your unconscious got it. Don't buy that. Don't buy that. That is one of the biggest lies on the planet. Okay. Because you still have to give them some kind of conscious understanding of what they just learned. Okay, it all goes together in your brain, not just the unconscious stuff. Okay, in order for them to develop the skill, they've got to have a conscious understanding of what they just did so that they can readjust it and make it better and better and better. They can't do that if it's if it's out of their awareness. How would they know what to correct? How would they know what to develop, redevelop, fix up, make better? They wouldn't know. They wouldn't know. Okay. Give them an experience. It's the best thing to do. Thank you. That, that's the very precious advice because this is a question that comes very often. And now we have one question from Saulius from Lithuania. If I could master one thing in sales and it would boost my sales the most, what would be that thing? Just one thing? Yeah. Well, I don't know what you do. I'm going to take a guess at this. Uh, um, let me ask, can he, can he answer you at all? Can, uh, can you respond back to you? Or, I don't no. know if, if he's connected right now, perhaps he yeah, will okay. write something. Right. Well, I will. Listen, there's a, there's, a, there's a, I had this question the other day. Somebody, I was on another, I was on another Zoom and, and the guy said to me, what's the one technique that you could tell me that is going to work immediately, like starting like tomorrow? And I said, well, first of all, you just made a mistake because you don't want to wait. You want to wait until tomorrow. Let's start with that. Okay. So yeah, it's true. And I said, but here's the one thing, if you really want to know, The one thing without that, it's, you can call it NLP and call it what you want, right? Most important thing you could do immediately that I know will work is get off your butt and start doing things, okay? Not be sitting back and waiting for something to happen, okay? Now, that sounds kind of simple. Maybe it even seems like it's off the cuff, but you know what? That's what you have to do. A lot of people, you know, especially in today's environment with this, you know, this virus thing going as corona thing, whatever, and, uh, and they're waiting, they're worried, they're waiting, they're worried, they're worried, they're waiting, they're waiting. They're waiting. Do things. Look what we're doing here today. Okay. You know how many Zoom things I've done in the last few days? You know how many times I've been on a phone with people for the last in the last few weeks for that matter? So you've got to do stuff. You know, don't don't just sit back and, and wait. So you've got to be able to do things. The other thing is now this is going to sound kind of crazy, but this doesn't apply to everybody. It only applies to people who have come and really learned basically, because they mentioned the book, have really learned the basic simple elements of persuasion engineering. Okay, because once you have that set of tools in your mind and you're able to use those skills, once you know, once you have that down pretty well, then I tell you the following thing. How much are you making? And they go, blah, 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 I'm making this much. I go, double it. And they go, what? I go, double it. I've had people come to that one particular program and quadruple their income. Now, that also means they're in charge of how much money they can make. So the other answer to the question is if you want to make more money, if you're in a, if you're in a sales position where you're salaried, You're stuck. I'm not going to lie to you. You're going to make so much money no matter how much you sell because the company's going to pay you a salary. Now, if you're on a salary plus commission, okay, I'm going to tell you this, you're also stuck. I think it's being stuck because you're going to get a salary and that salary usually is the amount that they know is going to keep you comfortable. And anything you make above that, so more than that, then that's going to become under extra money. But there's no reason for you to go work that hard for most people because they're comfortable. Okay. If you're not hungry, man, you got to be hungry. You got to really, and I don't mean you have to be hungry because you need more money. You got to be hungry because you want more excitement. You want more of the thrill of the chase, you know, all these different things. Why do people sell? You know, there's lots of different reasons why people are in sales. Some people just like the thrill of it. They love the thrill of the chase. Okay. And so that, that's important. That counts. So I don't know what the environment is that you're in, 
I was with a guy, I was doing a training in, in years ago in the 90s, early 90s, uh, with the country's, this country's, US country, uh, largest, second largest new home builder, okay? Second biggest in the country. And we go to a, a dinner one evening and he has some of his uh, sales, sales people with him. Uh, they all drove up in their, their cars and a few of them, and we're talking young guys, we're talking some of these guys were 24, 25, 26, 27. And some of them are driving up in Porsches, Jaguars, the cars like this. And I'm thinking, boy, these guys, these guys must do pretty well. And as I was thinking about this, one of the, one, another guy came up and said to the, the boss, he was a vice president. He said, if Bob, I'm thinking of buying a condo. You think I can afford it? You know, based on where we're headed with the company and my sales track record. And the boss looked at him and said, of course you can go out and get that thing. Hurry up before the prices to go up and the mortgage rates change. And he said, ah, oh, thanks. Uh, and I could see in this kid's face, he was going the next morning to buy this place. And I looked at Bob, that was his name. And I said, Bob, you think this guy can afford to buy that condo? He said, no. I said, what'd you tell him that for then? He said, I got, you see, I said, and you guys drive pretty nice cars. They're young guys. He said, yeah, I keep them hungry. He said, they're on, they're on pure commission, but I keep them hungry anyway, because as long as they stay hungry, they're going to keep selling like crazy. And they do. Okay. And I was like, I left. And that went in my brain. I said, of course, if somebody's not hungry, why are they going to work harder? Okay. So there's a lot of that going on. So again, I'm not sure what kind of a job you're in, um, in the, in the, you know, in, in your country, you're basically, you know, salary, you know, salary plus commission, whatever. Um, but you got to be hungry and uh, you'll do all kinds, you know, there's an old saying, you know, um, necessity is the mother of invention. And uh, that's been around for quite a long time. So if you if you don't have, you know, things you, you're not getting, you're not going to be hungry. Now that doesn't mean that it's all about things you can get. All right. But it also means, you know, pe some people sell, they, they do really, I know, I know a guy, I, I'm not going to mention his name. I know a guy that is still so hungry because he loves, he loves the thrill of the chase. And this guy goes after every opportunity he has to sell to people that he's involved in with the business he's involved in. Okay. He, he loves this stuff. He loves the, he loves the excitement. He gets up in the morning and he, and he's like drooling. Like he wants to get out there and start making phone calls and things. So there's some people who do that. I mean, that's their gratification and that's what they're hungry for. They're hungry for that real, that good feeling of success and, and, and everything else. So lots of things you can do. But one first thing is go do things. The things part is too general, of course. You got to figure out what those things are that would make you feel happy, okay? And go out and do enough things to be successful. Now, one more thing, because you see in NLP, we ask this crazy question. I say crazy question because it's really kind of incomplete. We say to people, we're going to work with someone, I go, so what do you want? And they say, oh, I just want to feel good. Well, that's easy. I can do that in three seconds. It's called anchoring. Okay. I listen to a powerful state from you. Boom. I anchor it. Boom. I fire the anchor off. Boom. I teach you how to fire your own anchor off and you're going to feel happy. Easy. That's a very incomplete answer to a very incomplete question. My more complete question is more around this. What is it the result that you want to get? Okay. And my next question after that is, do you have the resources to do that? So basically it goes like this because people say, Oh, I want to have a bazillion euros in the bank. I'm going, Great. That's really nice. That doesn't count. I'm really sorry. Okay. But I go, I want to have a red, and I call it a testosterosa because I've driven one once. And I got to tell you, it's a testosterosa. If you've never driven one, go drive one. And so they say, I want to have a, 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 a testosterosa in my, in my garage. I go, it doesn't count. I'm really sorry. All of those things are the rewards for doing certain behaviors. This is a behavior driven technology. Nothing changes unless the behavior changes period. Not, I'm going to repeat that. Nothing changes, okay? Nothing changes until the behavior changes. It's behavior, not just the feelings. Oh, I feel good. Great. What are you going to do? I don't know. You have to get results. So my first question would be, so what is it you want to get as a result? Or what is it that you want to get as a result in your life? And they still might say, well, if I had a bazillion dollars, no, no, forget that bazillion dollars in the bank thing. My basic premise is if they can take it away from you, it doesn't count, period. They can take your bazillion dollars. They can take your testosterone, all those things. They can take all these things away from you. So my next question is, can you get them again? 
If you can get them again, then you have a good set of skills. Does that mean you can go make the money again, even though they took the first ones away? You won't get another car because you have the skills to earn more money. This is all behavioral driven, not just, you know, not just all the airy, airy stuff, you know, like, wow, you know, yeah, man, I just want to, you know, I just want to, you know, I want to, I want to be, I want to feel like I can float among the clouds. Well, I got an answer for that too, but that's not going to help you to get the results you really want in your life. So everything is, is really results and behavior driven, especially if you're in business. Oh my gosh. I, I sit in more business meetings where they go, I go, so what do you guys want to, what, what do you guys want to do? Basically. And they all look at each other basically because they don't know. Now, does that mean they don't know what they want to do because of my question? Or does that mean they just don't know period? So I have to ask another question. What results aren't you getting that you want to get? Okay. And I might, may have to start there. So it really depends on, on, the, on the, I see environment I'm in and why I'm there for people. So results, 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 results. I told you I had, I was embarrassed. When I was a kid, I was a little bit embarrassed when I ran my first little company that I had. It wasn't really a company. I didn't set up a company. Um, and it was really, really only good during the summertime. But I can tell you this. I made, I had more money in my pocket on any given day than my dad made in a month, okay? And I was actually embarrassed about that because I knew number one, I couldn't tell him. And if I went and handed it to him, he'd say, where'd you rob that from? Where'd you steal that money from? And I couldn't tell him that part. So, so that was a lesson for me too, okay? Because I was able to make money easily the way I, and it was sales, I was selling little things, you know? And uh, so, that, that was another thing. I realized the result because if, if, if someone said to me, what are you doing for the summer? Because all they'd see me doing, by the way, is reading a book. I'd be reading a book. Okay. And my friends would come over and they'd say, do you have any more of those? It'll, it'll, they're not illegal things. I'd be clear about this. Okay. Or drugs or anything like that. Um, do you have any more of those items? And I'd say, yeah. And they go, where are they? I go, they're in the bag. Take them, take out what you want. Give me the money. Here's how much. No, put the, put the, put the money in a bag. I'm reading the book. Okay. So people were wondering, like, you know, how was I able to, how was I able to be, and by the way, I would treat my friends to things and they'd be thinking, where did Laval get the money? Well, Laval was working for it. Okay. And I was really working for it. It wasn't like I sat back. I set up a little organization. I set up, you know, my little, little marketing things, you know, so people knew what I had to offer and they came to buy stuff, plain and simple. And I learned that lesson. So that was a result. Now, because I got used to having that kind of money in my pocket. All right. We're talking, we're talking probably five, six, seven hundred dollars a week. Now it wasn't all year long, but that's a lot of money, especially back in the, this was in the 60s. Something I'm not gonna give away my age. But when I started then work for the ice cream place, well, forget the newspaper thing. <laughs> that, that didn't work. That lasted one month. Because I think I ended up with $15 for the month. Then when I worked for the ice cream place and I saw how much money I was making, I thought, oh no, this is not going to work because I was too used to getting real results <laughs> that satisfied me. So results, 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 behavior, 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 behavior. What's the behaviors that are going to get you the results? Period. Sorry if my answers are too long, just let me know. I love your answers. They are absolutely amazing. The next que uh, question is Agathe from France, who's asking, how can I use the NLP in my communication to prospects to get a good conversation rate, uh, rate without knowing the preferred channel of the interlocutor? Well, I don't know how you could not know the, 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 the you know the introductory channel. You know, I, I'm thinking that you you mean you know how do I know if they're going to be mostly visual, auditory, kinesthetic? The most powerful first of all, NLP at first is a communication technology. When I realized that, I was like, oh wow, this is oh man, I got to do better than this. I got I got man. Let me give you a quick example. I was already learning NLP by the way. I was already doing probably I might have even been in my master pack. I don't remember now, but. I was working in a company and my boss said to me, because I was the training manager, he said, John, put, put, put what you want in your budget. Oh, well, no, he said, tell me what you want in your budget for next year. And I said, okay, went back to my office, I plotted it all out, drew up a nice little visual thing. I made up a chart. I came and I handed it to him. He said, I put it on, put it on my pile of papers over here. I went in you know, a few days later. I said, did you get a chance to look at my budget you know, proposal? And he said, no, 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 no. Just tell me what you want. I thought, oh. 
I went back to my office. Luckily, I made copies. I made sure everything looked good. I brought it back to him. And I said, here, he said, I put that on my pile of paper. It took me three times, three times before I realized he wanted me to tell him about it. If I talked to him and gave him my budget auditorily, which I did, I went in there, okay, one more time. And I said to him, did you get a chance to look at my budget? Visual, visual, visual. He said, no, no, no. He said, just tell me what you want. I said, okay, I want this, this, this. He's all right, no problem. I'll take care of that for you. And I was done. I could have saved myself three trips. I don't know how you, you cannot get it, paying attention to people when they're, when they're communicating with you. First of all, you don't have to start the communication. You can say, hi, how are you doing? And they'll say, I'm doing good. And then you can ask a crazy another question. I teach people when they go into a sales call, for example, okay, the worst thing that people do is they bring in their PowerPoint presentation. They bring in their fancy, very expensive and well-made brochures. And they want to they want to show it to the person. Uh, I would I never do that. I don't even I don't even like PowerPoint. I don't even use PowerPoint, even in my classes. Okay. I only use a flip chart and four markers when I go in, when I do a training. I don't do PowerPoints or anything like that. I see people following along in the manual while we're, while we're training things. I said, what are you looking in the manual for? What I'm telling you right now is not in the manual. Everything in the manual, I'm not going to cover very much. I want to give you new things. You're going to back and read the manual at night tonight while you're waiting for class tomorrow. But the point is, you want to get the other person communicating with you. You don't have to communicate with them. You want to get, we want to get a conversation started? Just try to tell somebody. Just look at them and say, wow, that's really a nice shirt. Wow, hey, I, that's a nice one. Nice earring. I like your earrings. They really like, they really look good on you. And wait, wait a second. And they'll start communicating back. They'll say, Oh, really? Oh, my, no, my, these are my grandmothers. You go, you're kidding. Wow. How long have they been in a family? Now you got a conversation going. You really want to have a start a conversation? That's the way to do it. Not by, cause I can tell, and I'm going to, I'm, you know, I'm making this up now. I'm mind reading this part that in order for you to generate that question that you must have some kind of I don't want to say anxiety, but you have some kind of a feeling that stops you maybe from getting into a good conversation with people. I'm going to tell you how to do it. You don't have to be the person doing the conversation, the conversing, let's say. You just have to ask a bunch of questions and you don't even have to ask that many questions. I go into a new prospect. Okay. And if, if, especially if they're an owner of the business, first thing I say is, this is great. I love, I love you, but tell me more about your business. How did this, this get started? And they start, when they start with, let me tell you, my great, great grandfather started this business. I sit back I just sit back and I go, wow, this is going to be a good ride, baby. And you know what? They're going to give me all the information I could possibly want or need. I don't have to ask many questions. I might ask a few. And by the way, if they get, if they say enough information and I want more, I say, wow, tell me more about that. This is simple. This is called, I'm not a great conversationalist, by the way. You can ask my wife. If I, if I, if I want to do it, I can do it. But the fact is, and I know you probably won't believe this, I'm really kind of shy, actually, in, in groups of people, unless I'm training. I don't generally go start conversations. The worst thing I might ask somebody just to get something started is I'll say, how you doing? Are you staying out of trouble? That's my question. I say, hey, how you doing? You're staying out of trouble? And sometimes they go, oh, yeah. They go, that's too bad. And sometimes when they say, oh, yeah, I'm in a lot of trouble, I go, great. That's good. That means you're busy. Uh, those are the things that, you know, to be a conversationalist. Um, Sorry to tell you this, ladies, but I, I, I sometimes teach the guys in a regular class, you know, not one of these, you know, sex class things, you know, none of that stuff. Um, I teach them how to be a conversationalist because they just don't know how. And by the way, you don't have to be able to be a great conversationalist. You just have to know how to get the other person talking about them. That's more important than you talking about you. Get them talking about them. Believe me when I tell you this, you know, you can, you can, you can, you can, uh, yeah, somebody's got a red testosterone. Just say, "Wow, you got a testosterone. That's fantastic. I bet you really enjoy driving that." They're going to start telling you stories. Very simple. How you can do all of that without listening while they're speaking and picking up if they're favorites. Favorite. Everybody uses all the senses. By the way, I've, I'm, not, I'm tired of people coming and saying, "Well, I'm sorry, I just don't make pictures." Yeah, you make pictures. You might not see them real well. Maybe you're not aware you make pictures, but I can help you see pictures really fast. Everybody uses all the parts of that brain or they're dead, period, okay? Even blind people have images in their mind. They may not be what we see and how we see it unless they, unless they went blind later in life. If they were born blind, they still process visual stuff. It might be shadings of light, might be shadowing, might be nothing, but there's something in there, okay? And if you even listen to them, they'll even say, well, as I see it, and they can't see. 
So how, why would they say this? How can they actually reference that? So when people are communicating with you, if they're going to use visual words or auditory words or kinesthetic words or you know, the, the nonspecific words and even olfactory gustatory words, how do you miss those? There's only one way I know that, miss, that, that you can miss them. It's because you're in your own head thinking about stuff. Hmm. Get out of your head. Stay out of your head. We got to yeah. pay attention to the person out here. I keep telling people, I've been doing this for over 30 years now. The party is right in front of you. It's not in here. All the action is right in front of you. You're dealing with someone else, whatever it is, that's where the action is. Action's not in here. As soon as you go inside your head, you may not come back out, period. You're going to go in and worry about, oh, my God, what would they say if I said this? I don't know. Say it and find out. I find most people, many people anyway, have a great sense of humor. Great sense of humor. And if I say something funny to get them started, as soon as they chuckle and laugh, there's a few things going on. One, I started a conversation. Two, is I've got their neurochemistry running in the direction I want it to run in. Very simple. All the stuff is connected. And just imagine, it's all about just words. I, this fascinates me. You know, I do a newsletter. It's, you know, most of the articles are called, uh, uh, they're called like things like um, words are just words. Because most people think words are just words. Well, let me tell you, I've been saying this for years. Um, you've heard the fact that someone says, well, you know, um, a picture's worth a picture's worth a thousand. No, what is it? Oh, yeah, picture's worth a thousand words. Huh. One word is worth a thousand pictures. You just got to figure out which word, words those are, those are, but you're only going to get them from the person you're communicating with because they're going to give them to you. Very simple. You don't, have, you don't have to figure very much out with people. All you got to do is pay attention, open your ears, open your eyes, open all your senses and pay attention to them. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. There are plenty of comments to thanking you for your answers, which oh, are good. really, really interesting. And Uda from Belgium is asking if you should talk about a single exercise that allows to improve our career in the business, which would it be? Something to do? Yeah, an exercise to improve your career in the business. Learn as much as you can learn. You, you, you're never going to learn everything. You know, there's so much out there to learn. I, I tell you, I, I based all my experience, my experience is what built my skills. And when I, when I, when I had an experience of something, I'd go out and I'd try it out. Did I make 100% every time? No. You think I made mistakes? <laughs> we, we won't go there right now. But you know what? If you're not making mistakes, you're not making decisions. So the one thing I can tell you to do, sometimes you just have to close your eyes and jump. You know, I don't mean jump off things, but you have to just, just, just stop worrying about what could, what could happen because if it could happen, then it could not happen. You don't know. Jump right in there. Just dive right in. Okay. I, that's, that's the best thing I could tell you to do. And, and if you do that every day, you know, I wake up every day. I know people laugh. They don't think I do this. I do this every day. I had to stop using music because my wife, she gets up at a different time than I do. I'm usually up around four in the morning or so like that. And she's usually up around six ish. And, uh, And I used to play music, so, so my, my, my alarm clock would go off, and I got a big Bose system, not big one, but I got a Bose, Bose music system in our bedroom, and, uh, and I would wake up to Aretha Franklin, all right? You know, and I'd just jump out of bed and go, yeah, you know, I'm ready to go for the day. But, so now I don't do that in, anymore. I, now I got music in my head, and the first thing I do is the first thing I do is I open my eyes, and I do this. First thing I do is I look up, and I go, well, there's no dirt up there, so I guess I'm okay. I'm alive. That's important. Okay, if I'm looking up and I see dirt or a closed box, I'm done. I'm, I'm just going to go back to sleep and enjoy whatever, wherever I am. But basically, first thing I say to myself is, I take a nice deep breath and I say, life is good. Life is wonderful. And then I start thinking, oh, I got to go on the internet now and do my emails. And then things change in my mind. But that doesn't last very long. I got to do some emails and things. That's why I get up in the morning, in that early in the morning. Um, Get experience. Go out there, man. Just, just, just so there's so much the big world out there. I know it's tough now getting going out right now, but there's a lot of things you can do. Now, I know people are sitting in a lot of the questions. I just did these other zooms are, well, what can I do during this riot or this Corona thing? You know, I'm sitting in my house, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm not earning income or I'm earning a little bit of income. Blah, 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 blah. You know, get, first of all, get out of your pajamas. Let's start with that. Get out of your damn pajamas and get dressed. Okay, ladies, put your makeup on. You want to put makeup on? Put your damn makeup on in the morning. Guys, you want to shave? Get up, go shave. 
Who cares? Okay. Now, people say, well, how did you come up with all this stuff? I go, because I don't want to be bored. Let me start with that. When I first went into my business by myself, okay, and, and I thought, I'm okay. I'm going to do okay. A good friend of mine called me up. This is where I got this thing about what we should be doing during these times. Go on the internet. Go, go do, put, put little videos together. Video your kids having a good time and being acting silly and stuff. If you're a mother and a father, act silly with your kids and put it up on the internet. You might get a million views. You never know. And then people might say, what do you do anyway? Well, right now I'm at home, but what I really do is I sell A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Uh, and if you want to know more about that, email me. What's wrong? You can do that. Okay. I went to my own business and I'd get up in the morning, you know, whatever, get on the internet, do what I was doing. And a guy called me, a friend of mine called me up. He said, so you're in your own business now. I said, yep. He goes, let me ask you a question. You, you're working out of your house? I go, yeah, of course. I'm going to work out of my house. Why do I need to pay an office? I always, had, I always had the opinion, if I have an office and I'm paying for the office, when I'm in the office, I'm not making money. When I'm making money, why am I paying for the office? I might as well stay home and work. And he said, so my question for you is, because I, I think I want to help you here. I said, great, go ahead. This ought to be good. A friend of mine. He said, how do you know the difference between when you're home and when you're at work? I thought, oh. And I wanted to challenge him. But one of my favorite meta model challenge violation questions was, I said, what do you mean? He said, well, when I first went into my own business, you know, I'd wake up in the morning. I said, oh, that's a beautiful day so far. I might as well go out and cut the grass. It's early in the morning. They could cut, cut the grass. Then I'd wash the car. Then I think, oh, you know what? I'm outside already. I got my, 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 my relaxing clothes on and stuff. You know, I'm going to go for a walk in the park. I'd get home. I'd be back in, in the house at three o'clock in the afternoon and realized I wasn't doing anything to build my business. And I thought, yeah, that can happen. It can very well happen. He said, so I decided, here's what I did. I said, okay. He said, I get up in the morning. He said, and what I would do is I jump in the shower and I shave everything and put on a, a jacket and a tie, you know, not a suit necessarily, but he, he said, I get dressed up like I'm going to work. I would leave my house. I said, okay. He said, I'd go out to a diner and I had breakfast. I said, great. He said, I said, then what? He goes, then I go to work. So I'd come home take my jacket off, leave my tie on, and I would do my office stuff, whatever I had to do, make calls, whatever it was. So, okay. And he said, lunchtime, I put my jacket on, I'd go out for lunch. I'd meet with some friends, maybe we'd go to a cafe, maybe go to the diner, have a hamburger. And after lunch, I'd come back to work and I'd work in the afternoon. He said, okay. He said, at five o'clock, put my jacket back on, I'd leave, I'd go home. I'd go, to, I'd leave work, I go out down the street. I get a cup of coffee, maybe a you know Coca Cola, or maybe a drink. I said, "Yeah." I said, "Then I'd come home, take my tie off, my jacket, my shirt, put on my home clothes, and if I had to cut the grass, I'd go cut the grass." So I waited till the weekend, and I thought, "This is man, this is this is golden. This is wow." I mean, I I'm so glad this guy told me this. Now I didn't do it because knowing NLP as he was describing it, I was really really running it in my brain. So when I tell you I'm up usually between 4 and 4.30 in the morning taking care of office stuff, I'm up at 4, 4.30 in the morning doing office stuff, okay? You ask anybody who's following me on Facebook, I wish everybody a happy birthday if it's their birthday that day, okay? And I pop in doing the emails. I get all the emails done that I can get done. My day is usually finished by about 7 o'clock in the morning. Think about that, okay? And, that's, and I've done that. I've, I've, been, I've, done, I've changed my I – didn't, I didn't change the actual environment, okay, because I'm still in my home. But I change, I, I develop the routine and I keep up the routine. And I'm still doing it. Matter of fact, before I, before I, I, I came on to the Zoom, okay, um, I thought, uh-oh, I better go shave and uh, better put a, a nice, a decent shirt on anyway, you know, because I got I to gotta get on the Zoom thing. Otherwise, you would have seen me unshaven because time was going by for the day. You know, it was 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I was already pounding out the keyboard, you know, for most of the morning and other things. Now, Richard was on a Zoom just before this one with, uh, you know, in Italy. You guys are going to have Richard, too, coming up, right? One of these days, uh, next week or something? Okay. So that's what I did. So, so if you, if you, you want to get dressed, get dressed in the morning. You know, you don't have to put a full suit on and all those kinds of things. But get out of your pajamas. I don't know. I see, my na- I see my neighbor. You know, he comes out. He's got those lounging pants on and everything. I even said to him, I said, you working? He said, yeah, but only a couple days a week i said he said I, I have to go into the into the into the office twice a week i said oh okay well at least he's doing that and he's got a couple of kids too so i do see him playing with the kids in the yard things like that 
but at least he's leaving his house and going to work. If you can't leave your house, you still can get dressed. You know, have your kids get dressed because everybody's thinking, oh my God, when it comes back to these kids going to school, what am I going to do? They're not going to want to go back to school. They're so used to relaxing, having a good time. I said, have them get dressed, have class. It doesn't have to be reading, writing, and arithmetic. You know, open up, open up a history book, you know, and, and show them some things. Go on the internet and start Googling things and have the kids, do, have them Google it for you. They're probably better at it anyway. And then talk about those topics and things. You could do all kinds of things all day long. But for the person who's asking that question, just got to change things. I mean, just got to do things. That's really what it comes down to. And, uh, you know, so it's, and I know it sounds simple, but that's because it is. <laughs> exactly. Perfect. And uh, related a little bit to that, Nina from France asks, how do you use submodalities in business? How do I use what? How to use submodalities in business? Oh, that's a, that's one of my, oh, that's a great, it really is a great question. I know people say, oh, that's a, that's a stupid answer to a great question, but that is a great question. If you, if you realize the, the language, because remember, and I, I mean, I'll give you an example. You remember that every word that you have is encoded in some modalities. There are also ways of using your language to shift people's hub modalities. Now, I'm going to give you an example, first of all, at least in the U.S. I've, I've, I've been listening to this now for, let's see, eight, eight, 12, 12 or 13 years, okay, from two different administrations, not just the presidents themselves, but, but even some of their people, and even some of the people, at least here in the, in the Congress, because they all start picking up on, oh, that, oh that's really interesting. That's true. I have not ever heard before this, before this, this 12 years ago, and I watch a lot of TV, I mean, news, I should watch, I, I don't watch all kinds of television, I like the news. I don't even know why I like news, I guess maybe because I'm, I'm you know, following their language patterns and finding out what's new. First of all, I never heard anybody use the word calculus as a politician. They don't even know what calculus means, okay? Nor do they even know how to build a calculus. Let me start with that. But they've all been shifting some modalities before inserting the idea by saying the following thing. Let me be clear. And just saying that, for most people, whatever the blank image is or whatever the image is that's in their head, it's going to become more clear. So all of the words you have in your mind, they're words that think about this. If you know submodalities, then you know, get down the down list. You say, is it a movie or a slide? Okay. You can use words that change a, a slide into a movie. It's just about knowing how the adverbs work, how the verbs work, and these things. Um, that's what you do. You got, you got to be able to study the language and what works better. The other part is, because most people don't realize this, mode, um, modal operators, for those of you who know what those are, for those of you who don't know anything about NLP, these are motivator words. Okay? And what these do is they put, these put the juice behind the verb. So here's an example, and you guys can all play along. I know this is a content-oriented thing, but I think this is worth it, is worth it for the, I'm not gonna cover all the words. So let's say, for example, you're all gonna go out and go back to work or do something in order to earn income, and I'm gonna use the word Monday, okay? Just for this experiment. And then you, you say this to yourself, and I want you to notice the feeling you get with the word, okay? Say to yourself, I wish I could take off from work Monday. And as you do that, just notice the feeling. Now say to yourself, I want to take the day off from work Monday. And notice the feeling. And I'm going to ask you a question. I can't see your hands raising like I would in a class, but is that stronger? Is that feeling stronger or weaker than the other one? I'm going to guess it's, I'm going to guess it's stronger for most people. And then if I said to you, if you said then, I need to take the day off from work Monday, is that one stronger or weaker? There's no right or wrong to the answer, by the way. It's just a matter of which one's going to be your favorite modal operator. Okay? So that's important. And there are other ones, okay? If you said, well, you know, um, I must take off from work Monday, that's going to have a stronger feeling to it for, for some people, but not for everybody. And that's quite important. So let me tell you what I don't do with people. If I go and do a training thing, 
or let's say let's say an initial meeting with a company, and because they come and they they will they'll say the following thing. Wow, and I hate when they ask this question like this, or they make this statement. They go, "We want to do a training needs analysis," and I'm thinking, "Well, there's a modal operator for you." If I ask them what they need, guess what? That is going to be non-negotiable in their mind. That is non-negotiable because needs are non-negotiable. You need to breathe. You need to have water. You need to have sustenance. Okay. You don't need to have a good time in the park. Not really. Because if because that means not negotiable. You might want to go have a nice walk in the park, and that's okay. But if you have put if you put all of those needs into one place, not negotiable. So and and when it comes to training, they're basically telling you they're only interested in what the needs are. When there's a whole lot of other categories involved in doing trainings. So I never do a needs analysis. Okay. I do a I do a everything analysis if I do it at all. I've stopped doing those analysis years ago anyway. So how do you use some modalities in business? By the language that you use. Now let's say that you have, let's say we get to the point where you think taking off from Monday. Let's say that you say you you're at the point where you say, okay, um, let's see. Um, I'm going to take off from work Monday. Now you have an image of that and you have maybe sounds with it. I don't know, certain feeling with it, but the the thing you would say is I'm going to take off from work Monday. Now there's a couple of problems with that. And I'm going to slip a little bit into grammar, which we hardly teach in not least our schools anymore. Is first of all, it's too long. And two, it's the verb, the way the verb is used. So I'm going to change that. But the first thing I want you to do is if you say to yourself, I'm going to take off from work Monday, I want you to see that image in your mind, plain and simple. Now I want you to say the following thing is I'm going to change the verb. Okay, I'm going to take that part of the sentence and say this, I'm taking off from work Monday. Notice what changes. If you had a slide before, I'll bet you now have a movie. If you had a movie before, I'll bet it's either faster or slower. But the thing I know is for sure is you get to a decision point and you actually make a decision. Because if you say, I'm going to take off from work Monday, it means you're going to, going to. It means you haven't. It means you haven't made the decision finally. That's what the language does. That's how you start using some modalities in language. And it doesn't have to be just in business. It could be all over the place. It doesn't matter. I take every opportunity I can to use whatever I can to find out what's going to work better. You know, you all got the whole element of rapport going on as well. Now, that's another whole subject. We can cover that at another time. Fact is, I can find out and, and try any patterns out I want, and it's how I learn with the cab driver, with the clerk at the hotel desk, with the waiter or the waitress in a restaurant, okay? It doesn't matter to me. I, I'll, it doesn't, I do this anyway. I mean, it, People say, well, I don't use my NLP at, at home. I just use it at work. And I'm thinking, you're not using it at all. Because if it's not, if it's not part of your life and how you, how you have formatted your brain, then you're missing something. Because everything, first of all, is, is learning dependent, right? Learning is state dependent, rather. So, by the way, if you haven't gone home and used rapport and tried to make better rapport with your kids or whatever in your house, whatever your home, uh, you're missing something because I'm bet there are times, listen, everybody doesn't have a rosy life. Every day is not just so grand and, and wonderful. You know, things happen. We can't help it. Things happen. Look at this virus thing. Things happen. Now you have people experiencing really bad stuff in their homes because they're, they're getting nasty with their kid, hollering at their spouse, blah, 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 because why is this? I don't get this. These are the people that you love. These are the people that you live with. These are the, you know, I don't get all this, but if you were, if you were living NLP. What that means is people, oh, so does that mean I have to believe? No, no. Listen, it's you've put you've put NLP into your environment. And you don't have to think about it. One day you're all going to meet my son. My son's name is John Sebastian. John Sebastian is now 34 or 35, going on consultant. He actually was going on consultant when he was 20. He said, Dad, you know what you need to do? I go, no, what, son? He said, Well, you ought to take a look at this. Blah, 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 blah. He's an NLP trainer. He's been an NLP trainer since he was a teenager. He doesn't train NLP. He runs business. He runs his own business. Even though he's negotiated for people. You think we sat him down and taught him NLP? No, not at all. He grew up with us. And he also grew up with Richard, 
because we would take him to seminars and he would sit in the back and play with his little toys when he was very small, right? And, and, and just pick these things up. And you, I do remember Richard did teach him math once. You know, we were in a seminar in, uh, in Germany and John's there, we took him out of school for two months to go get a real education over in, in Europe with seeing new things and experiencing new people and new languages. We went to Germany, Austria, and, and England. And uh, we traveled around like that. He was actually picking up some of the German language, actually, and uh, while he was there, because he, he kind of took, uh, took a liking to it. I get the structure of it. And I'm running a class, and Richard says, uh, well, he says, okay, you, you take the you know, afternoon. And I said, okay. And I'm doing the afternoon class, and Richard popped his head in. Then I saw him leave. And then I saw him pop his head in, and then he disappeared. I didn't see him, but I didn't see him leave the room. And I'm like, where's Richard? You know, now I couldn't really well say that over in the microphone in the seminar, but I mounted it to the back to my wife, you know, Kathleen. And I said, I said, actually, I want to know where my son was. I said, where's John? And she went, he was under the table with Richard. Richard was teaching him math. Why was he teaching him math? Because John didn't like math. Why didn't John like math? I don't know. And he was under the table. Nobody could see them. And I, you know, I gave the class a break of exercise or something. I went and peeked up under the table and I run under there, got the pencils out and Richard's showing him how to do math. Other than that, we didn't teach him NLP. My son, he did, he's already negotiated contracts for people. He's 22 years old. We didn't teach him NLP. We didn't make him go to, go to school and sit in the chair and do the exercises. Never happened, never happened. One time we, I saw him, I came home doing something. He must've been about seven or eight. He's got Richard's videotapes in the VCR watching them on television. And I think, what did you learn? He goes, nothing. It's not nice. No. But Mr. Richard, he called him Mr. Richard. But Mr. Richard is really funny. And I thought, that means his stuff's going in. Don't fool me. But I didn't say anything to my son. So you've got loads and loads of loads and loads and loads and loads of opportunity to use it. Put NLP into your environment. Yeah, thank you. It's all really all about uh, living NLP. And the next question is very connected to that. I think you already answered partially to it, at least. Okay. It's about the present situation with the coronavirus. And the question is from Thomas from Switzerland. How do we position ourselves in the current situation? And what strategies should we put in place? Great questions. Um, the current situation is this. Everybody's in fear. Uh, not everybody's in fear, fear, but it's the fear of the unknown because nobody really knows what's going on and nobody really knows what's going to happen. My thing is what you should be doing now is doing whatever it is you were doing as best you can, preparing for when it, what, what we tell you, when these economies open up, it's going to be gangbusters. It's not going to be, it's not going to be like, well, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. You're going to have restaurants that have were forced to close. You're going to have some people who gave up and, and fold their businesses. Um, but that doesn't mean you have to do this, okay? You, you, can, you can start doing things now. Get on, you have customers? Get on YouTube with them. Do, do Zoom things with them, okay? Answer their questions. Uh, if you're teaching NLP and you're doing some NLP things, do a couple of Zoom things and, and give some people, a, you know, how do you, here's how you do this technique. You know, there's nothing stopping you from doing that. Stay engaged. Keep the people that you know engaged. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had a very great surprise, which I, I of course, it was a surprise, so I didn't really count on it, is my sister texted me and says, oh, there's a Zoom thing tonight. He says, there's a Zoom thing every night, you know? He says, no, 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 this is what our cousins. And of course, my question was, what cousins? Which cousins? Because I have uh, probably over 80 first cousins, 80 Italian families, you know? And she said, oh, well, this, this part of the family is probably gonna be about a dozen of them there. And I said, well, give, send me the link. And I just haven't seen my cousins that much. You know, we're all older now. We all got our own kids. We all have our own jobs, our own careers. And I got in the Zoom thing. And I had myself an absolute bliss. I go, I even asked her, so how long is this going to last? She goes, ah, usually not more than half an hour. Three hours. Three hours we were all together. So these are the things. I mean, you can set, if, you're doing, if you have a business, okay, you can start doing things. I tell people, like our trainers, I have our trainers. They go, what am I supposed to do now? Because we don't do online training. We're doing a little portion of it online at the moment. Okay. And we have allowing some things to be done online. The fact is you can't really do online trainings and have people really learn how to do NLP. Not really. So there's enough of the content that we can deliver that's easy enough online. But when it comes to the actual working face-to-face, because -face, that NLP was meant 
to be working with humans face to face, not on a screen. I don't care how good you think you are. You can't calibrate everything because first of all, they're only showing you from, from here up anyway. You know, I mentioned that before. However, you can refresh their skills. You can play games, NLP games, you know, language games, things like this, just to keep them refreshed because chances are, if they're out there seeing clients, they're probably not out there seeing clients right now. You know, and they could be working with their clients. How are you doing? I'm just checking up on you. How's everything going? I know, you know, what, what else can I do for you right now? Blah, blah, blah. There's lots of things you could be doing, you know. The, the, the only thing I know is, is life is not going to be the same when we get back. When, when, when we get back to the, there's not going to be, we're getting back to normal. Normal is going to change. That much I know. Um, it's, it's definitely going to change. What it's going to be like, I have no idea. Uh, wish I did. I wish I did. I, I don't have a crystal ball I can look in. Um, what can you be doing? You could be preparing more, do, doing stuff. Just get, on, get online with your customers. Get online with potential customers. Uh, I'm not a fan of doing, you know, working with potential customers and trying to nail a sale online like this. But hey, that's the best thing you can do right now. Go for it. You know, you can't do anything wrong. Uh, I mean, it's better if you're face to face with them because they can always shut off the computer if they don't want to listen to you anymore. Uh, and same as on the phone, they can just hang up the phone. That's why I tell people if you're going to work with a potential client, you might as well go face to face with them. Uh, the chances are they're not going to hang up, or at least the best they can do is say, "No, get out of my office, leave." You know, blah blah blah. Uh, and by the way, that reminds me for you people in sales, if you've never been thrown out of someone's office, I don't mean asked to leave. Basically, you know, get out. Um, if you don't, if that's never happened to you, you're not working hard enough. Hmm. Yeah, get up and do things. Just do things. Get out of your jammies, man. Go do things. Great. Sofiane from Belgique uh, is asking. Where? Belgique, uh, Belgium. Oh, Belgium. He's, he's asking, how do you sell your skills to businesses? I don't. I don't sell my skills to my skills to businesses. So results, you know, go back to that word. I want to find out what are the results they want to achieve, even in a business. You know, if you go in and say to them, listen, what do you want? You know, what do you want to be able to do or what do you want as a result? They're going to say, well, tell me what we do. Well, we don't want this. We don't want that. Don't throw that information away. That information is very valuable. Don't throw it away. Um, yeah. I don't sell my skills. I, I, if, if someone says, well, what's this NLP? Most, most of my corporate customers don't even know that I do NLP and train NLP, at least not initially, because there's no point in me saying, well, I'm an NLP trainer. They're a big deal. So um, you might find that out in a lot of places. That's why even if you go in and, 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 uh, and tell people, well, uh, well, I, I do this. I, 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 I sell this thing, uh, this service. So what? So what? What results have you gotten? And that's what they want to know. And what results can you help me get? I do this with people who are writing job interviews. I'll make it even easier. Yeah, I've read job interviews. So I, was the president of my, I was the president of my sorority or my, or my fraternity. And my answer to that is, so what? What did you do? What did you accomplish as the president of your sorority or your fraternity? Because, you know, all those things are set up to run, to run charity events. Besides drinking beer on the weekends and having a good time and partying. But the, the reason why the fraternities and sororities exist is to support charity events. They raise enough money and they, and they, and they you know, donate it to a charity. I, that's great. I love that. We work, I work in a, in a, uh, a, a community service group, Italians uh, in, our, in our area. Okay? We raised $30,000 and donated it to a local orphanage. Okay? Um, We've donated, I don't, can't even count the amount of money we've donated to St. Jude's Hospital. I don't know if you even know what that is, but here in the U.S., that's a very well-known hospital where they, they, they do what they can to cure kids of cancer and stuff, and they don't charge anything. They don't charge, they don't charge the family a thing. They're only working on donations. But if you just say, well, I was the president of the sorority or the fraternity, I'm, my, my response is, okay, what's, and, and then what? What happened? And they go, well, even on a resume, well, I was in charge of 50 people. I was in charge of 75 people. So what? What did, what did that result in? It had a result in something. How much money did you make the company? How much money did you save the company? How much money did you make for the charities? 
Uh, that's what I want to read in a, in a resume. And a lot of people are afraid to put that information down because they're afraid you're going to call the company and, and verify it. Then that's easy. Don't lie. Tell the truth. Okay. I took a company, one company, when I was working, I was an employee with that company. They were the worst, worst, worst company for safety. Okay. They had more fingers lost in things like this than I can even, th I can even count. And, they, and the president of the company said, John, I have a wonderful golden opportunity for your career development and a challenge. I thought, oh, great. And he said, I want you to see if you can straighten this safety thing out. I said, great. Well, it took me probably close to a year, probably took me six to eight months to do this. But when I got finished with this company, these people went, are you ready? Five years with no, that's zero, no lost time accidents. Okay, I don't know what happened because I left after that. Now, to me, that's a result. I can go, if I can go to a company and they go, oh, you, you want to be the vice president of manufacturing? Oh, what's your great claim to fame? So well, besides being fired by the same guy six times, which also happened, I said, I took one plan on a safety project and ran until they got zero, no, zero lost time accidents for five years. Let me tell you, they, they, that gets their attention because and I'm not joking. They can call the company. I don't really care. The other one is um, I had to put together, they put me in charge of a thing, it was all results. And the guys I worked with, I'm going back to the, listen, hang out, hang out with people who are willing to help you out and mentor you. And they're, they're already successful. This guy was the plant manager of this place. And I could tell you what, I, I don't can't tell you how many dreams I had about running him over with my car in the parking lot. You know, he was just that kind of guy. This guy was just, he was just, but I realized he was really being nasty with people because he wasn't getting, he wasn't getting the result he wanted out of them. I thought, well, that's not the way to do it, but let's see what happens. Well, he finally got the result. People started paying attention to what he was, what he was doing. And it was very simple. Every day he would ask for the results of the production. He'd say, how are you running? How'd you run last night? And we go, well, we're running at 95%. What? 95%? He turned around and walked away. He didn't even get to finish. He said, don't come bother and talk to me until you're doing 100% of this. I'll take 90% of that, and I'll take 95% of this. And he turned around and walked away. It came to a Christmas party time. And all of a sudden, there was no Christmas party planned. And one of the secretaries went and said to him, um, we haven't made any plans for the uh, uh, Christmas party. It's in, you know, we should be doing one you know, in the next week or two weeks. He said, how are we running out there? And there was no Christmas party. No Christmas party because we weren't running to the standards that he set. Now, the standards that he set were actually fair, but we weren't running them. They were tough. This guy was tough. But it was all result. I can keep going back to that word every single time. Result, result, results. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's also Stephanie from France who is asking, how do you quickly lift the customer's financial break on a sale? How do we what, what, say it again? How do you quickly lift the customer's financial break on a sale? So if the customer actually has, uh, has a problem with the price of your product um, during a sale. Okay. It depends on if it's, depends on if it's, of course, if it's a product or if it's a service. Okay. In other words, if you're a consultant and it's, your, and it's a service, you're selling your brain power. So there is no reduction as far as I'm concerned. There's no reduction. Now, if it's a product and you do have other people in the area who are selling the product, um, then you, get, you do have to consider, can you make a concession? Can you, you, know, give, give, you know, take more of a product, uh, discount off or more of a you know, price, you know, a little bit more money off the price, blah, blah, blah. The other thing is, because a lot of, you know, the question first becomes, is it an objection? If they're making an objection, okay, and I teach this in persuasion too, an objection doesn't mean no. An objection is a challenge for you to solve their problem or giving you a problem to solve. Your price is too high. Now, you can change, you can challenge that a bunch of different ways. You've got to be able to back up whether or not you can do it or whether or not you don't want to do it. I've been in lots of situations like this. So the first step, really, first step 
is be prepared to walk away. I'm not telling you to walk away. I'm saying be prepared to walk away and leave it on the table. Okay, that's number one. Number two, you got the takeaway clothes. Okay, the takeaway clothes is great. This isn't for you. I've had people, I've, we, we, listen, this series, we turn people away from our seminars just because we don't want them there. We do a little research on it. We find out eh, they like to start trouble. Da, 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 da. They've had problems with these other things. No, no, we just have, this isn't for you. Go, go, to, go somewhere else and learn NLP. But I don't want you here. You know, corporate wise, I've, I've told people um, that they probably, right, actually right up front, there are a number of ways of handling them if they're objections. But again, I'm going to tell you, objections don't mean no. That's why there are ways of overcoming some of these. If it's the price and it's, and it's, um, objects you're selling, products, you know, then an easy one really is uh, one of my favorites is I'll sell them. They'll say, oh, the price is too high. And I do something called, out, I call it out framing anyway, you know, basically I'm going to move this out, out of that domain that they placed it in. And I'm going to give them two more choices to make one, 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 no, two choices. They can make one. And I tell them, I go, the price or the cost. Now, most of you, probably have a question when I say that. And it's probably a question you probably have is what's the difference? That's great. When they ask a question back, I'm obligated to respond. So I say, huh, now you wanna know submodalities? Let's just go back to the lady who said how to use submodalities in, in business. You also have your voice. So you can increase, you can change your voice. You can change the volume. You can change you know, the, the rate of speech. You can change all kinds of things. You can change distance. So when they say, what's the difference? I say, well, there's a big difference between the price and the cost. The price is a little bit you pay for today. The cost is how much it's going to cost you the longer you decide to wait. So you're really better off deciding now. Most of the time, they consider that. They consider that. And sometimes they'll say, well, yeah, but you know, I can get it. I can get it. If it's the same product, you do have to consider what you're willing to do. Sometimes you go, well, I can get a similar product. I go, yeah, I know. You know, when I was a kid, I wanted a bicycle, right? And my dad didn't have a lot of money. And the bicycle I wanted was $25, but that was a lot of money. So my dad went and got me a cheaper bicycle. It was $10. And he said, here, this will be good. It's a $10 bicycle. It's got two wheels. It's got the pedals. It's got handlebars. It'll be fine. And I thought, yeah, all right. The bicycle fell apart within a month. These are things, parts are falling off it. And we're replacing the parts. We're replacing the parts. We had to buy a new wheel. We had to buy this. We had to buy a new chain. All these things. And then it dawned on me. I said, Dad, you know, we got the $10 bicycle. I understand that. But then over the next month, you know, we spent uh, another $20. We paid $5 more for this bicycle that's still only worth 10 bucks. And Dad looked at me. <laughs> I won't tell you what he said. He said, you are a little smart ass. And I said, yes, Dad. Of course. So... There's lots of different ways of handling it. Just remember, it doesn't mean no. It's because they're asking. The objection is they're saying, solve this problem. If you're willing to negotiate a different price, and that's the only thing left to settle on, you can then say to them, make it the final objection. In other words, they, you know, you're selling it for 100. They go, oh, I can get it for 90. You say, is that the only thing stopping you from giving me your business? And they go, yeah. I go, that's it. So if I, can, if I can get you better price, you'll give me all your business. That's what you're telling me. I want to make sure. Yes. Great. Do not give them the price right then and there because they will resent you for it. Because they'll say, you could have given me that price to begin with. The idea is to say, let me get back to you. I'll get back to you this afternoon. And you go back to your office. You have to talk to somebody, talk to them. If you don't have to talk to anybody, no problem. Then you call them back. You go, I can give you 90. I can match it. They're going to say, how about 89? You go, let me tell you something. Call me back when you, when you come to your senses. Wanted a better price, I gave you a better price. And by the way, don't ever forget the following thing when it comes to products. One person sells it for 90. You can sell it for 100. You sell it for 100. And your service is worth 110. And the other person's isn't. When I would give a price for my consulting, I would, first of all, I tell them, I would do the thing. Nobody tells you to do this in sales. The things I tell you to do, nobody tells you. They'd call me up and they go, hello, John. I go, yeah. 
And they go, uh, I'm interested in bringing you in. And I say, first of all, I go, well, how'd you have to find out about me? I got a private number, consulting number. They go, oh, well, somebody that you did work for highly recommended you, and then we're thinking of bringing you in. And I say, well, you don't want me. I tell them that right out, right out of the gate right there. I say, you don't want me. And they, of course, they're stunned. They go, well, why not? I go, because I'm expensive. I'm also worth it. Now, then they say, well, well, how much? I go, depends on what do you want? Tell me what you want, what result you want to get, and I'll give you a price. That's it. So, and I've had, I've, I've had it where people do the, you know, they go, okay, we'll have to get back to you. No, that's, that's, that's a lot of money. And they go, so I had one guy say to me, well, you know, this other consultant, I'm going to make up numbers, okay? I said, I can do it for a thousand. He goes, I got a guy to do it for 800. I go, yeah, well, my thousand is 24 hours a day not in your office helping you out for nine to five. Oh no, I'm with you 24 hours. There's 24 hours in a day. I'm your, if you decide to come up with a question at three o'clock in the morning and I'm sleeping in the, down the street in the hotel, call me. It might take me a few minutes to wake up, but I will get you, I'll, I'll answer that phone. And one guy did it once, kept me up till four o'clock in the morning. He was drinking vodka though. I was drinking water. He thought it was vodka. That's amazing, John. Thank you so much for all this knowledge that you are sharing with us. Experiences, experiences. <laughs> amazing. Nezia from France, related to coronavirus, she says, many leaders live in a blur of uncertainty due to the lack of perspectives in the midst of the COVID crisis. How to turn doubts and questions into perspectives? Well, here's the problem. The, the general overall problem and why this happens is nobody knows what's going on. I, I've, gotten, I've gotten different. I watch the news. That's why I watch the news. Every day it's something different. Well, we're working on now. My country now is now working on with a different, I think, 100 different companies working on a vaccine. They don't even know which one is going to work. They have this one medication thing that they already know works, but not exactly for everybody at the same time. But they could be using that. So they are using it. Some doctors are using it. Some doctors have been told, no, no, you're not allowed to have that. I don't know. There's, there's too much conflicting information. But that's real, that really is a, a real issue that's out there. They have a blurred vision because it's conflicting information. Um, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna liken this to the experiences that people have on an everyday basis, okay, whether they whether they believe this or not. And, and I learned this again. I learned this when I was in manufacturing. If you walk in to your office and there's papers all over the place and th different things all over, the, all over your office, your brain is going to be blurred, for lack of a better word. And it's going to be very hard. You're going to walk in and go, oh, where do I start? Your brain, your, 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 everything's going to be like, blah, blah, blah. okay? If you walk into your office and your desk is neat, your books are on a shelf, right? Whatever. You're probably going to know where to start. Well, it's the same thing. There's too much conflicting information. See, I learned this when I said manufacturing because sometimes it was a baking business, baking industry. I think one of the country's larger baking bakers. And uh, sometimes things would go wrong. You know, dough would be flying all over the place because the machine broke down and blah, blah, blah. And people kept trying to make little minor adjustments to kind of get everything back on track. I never did that. I never did that. I just I do the same thing with NLP when I teach NLP, by the way, or, or I'm working with somebody. I stop what I'm doing. So I would stop the whole production. I'd stop. I go shut everything down. Now management doesn't like that, by the way, because they're going, oh my God, we got to get the stuff out the door. I go, the only thing you're sending out the door is garbage. So shut down. I make everybody clean everything up. Clean. Papers clean. Floors clean. You know, machines clean. Everything's shiny again. Everybody ready? All right, go. Let's go. Start them up again. And we start like that and clear the slate and start again. So that's not, that's not happening now with this because we're getting too much conflicting information. Um, how, do we, how do I deal with this? Uh, I expect the unknown. I, I expect the unexpected. I've done it for a long time and I've made it okay because I go, you know what? It's not, it's not so much what we need more than anything else, fast. Every, this is for anybody. 
And I, I'm thinking, I, I may have learned this myself when I was younger, is people said there was, a, there was a thing when they asked Richard the other day, actually today too, on resilience. It's not, res, it's not resilience that's the most important thing. And what's really most important thing is adaptation. We've got to be able to adapt minute by minute, maybe daily by day, you know, every day, each day, we've got to adapt to what's going on and make yourself okay doing that. You may not even know what to do, but make it okay. I've already, I've already decided years ago, I got a favorite t-shirt of mine. It says, don't you trust your government to do the right thing? Because I don't, because there's too many people involved in the thing. Somebody's going to ultimately make a decision. It's either going to be my government or the people. Right now, it looks like the people are making the decisions because now they're going, but I, I don't know if that's a good idea myself. I'm not even suggesting that, that people should do that. I'm saying you should go out. If you're going to go out, be careful, very careful. I still go out. I put my mask on, I put my gloves on. I go to the, I call it the stupid market. I go to the, the supermarket and do my shopping and stuff. I call it the stupid market because people are going, they're going crazy. You know, I can't even believe that we ran out of toilet paper. How do we run out of toilet paper? This is the United States of America, you know? And we're not supposed to run out of toilet paper or paper towels. I, I, anyway, it was the craziest thing. So, but I expect this now. I've expected this for a long, not this particular thing. 911 hit, everybody was frantic. And I was like, okay, here we go, another adventure. So, People say, well, aren't you scared? I go, no, I don't want to be scared. I don't want to be scared. Fear is not a good place to be unless somebody's giving you, you know, going to kill you basically or something like that, you know, and you've got to speak of fear. And that's okay, fear, if you want to punch this one out. That's very different. But to be fearful of what I don't know what's going to happen next, I don't know what's going to happen next. And then you hear all the rumors, you know. And by the way, there were lots of rumors before, after 9-1-1. Then there was rumors when Obama was the president. Then there were rumors now that, that Trump's the president. There's all kinds of rumors, you know, and there were the same rumors about every president. George Bush was going to suspend the Constitution, which he can't do by himself. He's going to suspend the Constitution, and therefore, we're not going to have any rights. Then it was, then it was President Obama. Oh, Obama's going to suspend the Constitution, and then we're not going to have any rights. Now it's Trump. Trump's going to suspend the Constitution. <laughs> Nobody suspends the Constitution. They've got to be crazy to suspend the Constitution. And that's just one example. Just one example. And I don't know how it works in all the other countries, you know, you know how the governments are set up. I know about the United States. Uh, I know how some countries are set up, but, you know, they're not really set up the way the United States is set up. We're a very unique way we're set up. And that's a problem. Because, you know, you can go to, you can go to, you can go to, I live in New Jersey here. And so you, you can drive in New Jersey and it can easily break a driving law and I can go to Florida and it's okay to do that same thing I broke the law for in New Jersey. So New Jersey, I can get a ticket and in Florida, it's okay because there's different laws in different states. And we want to keep track of this coronavirus thing and everybody's got their own opinions. Oh my gosh. And then they start blaming this. This is why, this is why people, my thing is it's probably a lot easier. Okay. Don't even think about, don't, don't, don't let the fear it's not a good neurochemistry thing. It's not, it's not a good neurotransmitter thing to be developing those, those, those neurochemicals that have you fear or go into negative states. They're not very resourceful. Not very resourceful. Um, when I was young, and I, was, I guess I was in the Boy Scouts. I was in the Cub, Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts. You know, they took us in the woods. They took us to, you know, we slept over and did camping stuff and that. We learned how to cook on the fire. We had to make the fire ourselves and we weren't going to eat. We had to catch our own fish you know, and all these things, how to learn how to get water uh, and make sure it was safe to drink if you were taking it out of a well or something, you know, whatever. And so I guess in my own mind, I was, I was always thinking to, to kind of be prepared, but I never knew what to be prepared for. Now it makes sense to me. Be prepared for you don't know what's going to happen next. And that's an okay state because I'm okay with it. My wife's okay with it. You know, my son, he's going to be a father a few and he has no idea what the future holds for, for, for his, for his, his child is going to be born. He has no idea, but you know what? Being okay. He's doing okay. I just spoke with him before we got online. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. So it's, yeah. 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 You want to, to add something about this? What's that? I'm good. 
Okay, good. So expect the unexpected. Yeah, expect the unexpected. I don't know. Yeah, it sounds kind of it sounds kind of crazy, and be prepared. Yeah, because one question that came on the chat was actually about uh, what what is the the right strategy to to to, add, to have now. So I think that this is the answer also to that question. Okay, good. Me, if, yeah, if I if I had a, if I had a real good answer for it, other than that one, I'd give uh -huh. it to you. But I don't have it. It's expect the unexpected. Yeah. Okay. So Christina from Spain is asking how to create a good hook to make online sales. How to make a good hook to do online sales. My first answer is I'm not a fan of online sales. I'm not a fan of over the phone sales. I, don't, I, do, I also understand that it's possible. And I'm not even saying there's anything wrong with it. It's just not my favorite thing to do. Okay? I prefer face-to-face -face sales. So... I guess if I was going to do online sales, I don't think there is a good hook for every person. That's going to be one problem. You can generalize things. Of course, you probably read all of you go out and read any of these blurbs out there. This is the best thing since, since you know it's white white sliced bread and everything else. But I prefer French bread, by the way, um, and and that's first on my list. That's Italian bread is second, but this white sliced bread thing. Here's how here's how wonderful it is. It's the best you ever tasted in your life. Blah blah blah. All this stuff. I don't know that that's that 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 even works. Um, if I had to do online sales, I would I would first opt for phone call. You can certainly say something in the online marketing because that's marketing. I guess, I, guess I'm, I should make the distinction. There's a difference between marketing and sales. Marketing gets you interested enough to go to the door. Sales is then you open the door, invite the person in. Sit them at your table, feed them what you want to feed them, and find out if they're going to buy what you want them to buy. So most people don't know the difference between marketing and sales. And there's a very big difference between marketing and sales. If I were doing certain marketing, I can get people, people say, oh, so can you increase my sales? Mm, I could probably increase the people knocking on your door. But it's up to you to do the sale. Because I can't do the sale for you. But I can help you to create marketing that gets people to be interested in what you're doing. So there's a difference. So that's what I'm saying. So if you do good marketing, then you could probably get a person to give you a call. There's nothing wrong with saying, hey, if you're really excited about this, give me a call. And then it's very easy. I mean, if you're going to do this on a phone, say, and I promise you, just give me a call. We'll talk or I can call you. Give me your number. I'm not going to bother you. I'm not going to call you every day and, but, and hound you and, and come after you, chasing you every day. I'm not going to do that. I'm not a beggar. Um, give me 10 minutes. If I can't, if I can't solve your, if I can't solve your need or your, your, you know, I can, if I can't make you happy in 10 minutes, I hang up the phone and we're done. You'll never hear from me again. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. See, everybody thinks because you're going to be in sales, you have to hang on to their leg like a, like a puppy until they buy it from you. No, no, that's not a good way. That's not a good reputation to get. I know people who've done it and their, their reputation is junk. Because it to be too much, too much, too much, too much. People end up blocking their, blocking their email, blocking their phone, you know, all this stuff. So doing it online is not the sale. Um, doing it online is marketing. So maybe you need to get better marketing done. You know, there are lots of different places you can go to check out unless you want to do some of your own. I wouldn't overload. I know a lot of people have these things called click funnels. Uh, those work to a certain degree uh, for certain services and things like that. Um, and then you can upsell and all those kind of things. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those. But you first, before you get them to do the click funnels, have to get them to go to the first one. After they read the first first message, you got to get them to go to the first one. If they can't go, if they're not willing to go to the first one, guess what? Then your 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 initial marketing, they knocked on the door, or man, they didn't even want they didn't want to knock on the door. I give you an example. There's a lot of them now. They have these these online video thing. Oh, listen. First of all, they lie in the beginning. They say, "I'm going to give you the solution to this problem that you might have." I go, oh, cool. The problem I have, then, then you go find out. And then I got to sit and listen to a video. And the video is going to run for a half an hour. And as soon as they start with the, with the board thing and they start drawing all this crap out, I click off the video. The only ones that might stay on are the ones that go, listen, if you don't have time to do this video thing, click here and I'll, and I'll let you read the, read the presentation. I can at least read through it and get it. Okay. But I'm not going to sit there and watch it. I don't have a half an hour in a day to sit and watch a video and get to the end. And it goes, now to get the solution, 
just send me $19.97 and I'll, I'll give you the PDF, da, da, da. Oh, by the way, once you do that, if you really want more about this, blah, 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 I'm not, I'm not that, I'm just not that kind of person. I'm not that kind of person. I'm a sales, I'm, a, I'm not even a sales guy, but I'm, I'm interested in sales. So I want it to be easy. Why do I want it to be easy? Because I know that most salespeople work very hard. So when a salesperson comes to me, I'm a lay down customer. I'm, I'm called I'm a, what they call a lay down customer. If I walk, I already know what I want. I walk in a store and go, I want that. And they don't even have to sell it. I'll go and buy a car. I'll go and buy a hundred thousand dollar car. I walk in and go, I want that car. And they go, well, let me tell you, no, you want to sell the damn car? You don't want to sell the damn car. I want the car. Oh, okay. That's it. I go, yeah. Now they should feel good about that, but no, then they feel terrible because they didn't have to work at it. But us salespeople who are, who are in sales a lot, we feel sorry for the salespeople. We want to make it easy for them. I went and bought my, my, my nephew who graduated college. I want to get him a nice suit. I take him to the store. I go, I'm going to buy you a suit. Come on. He said, what for? I said, well, you graduated college. Your birthday's coming. Christmas is coming. So I'm going to combine this. So he tries on a suit. Sales guy goes, it's a nice suit. It's a beautiful suit. Looks good on a kid. He says, all right, good. I'll take it. I say, listen, you looked at that other one too. And I saw the look on your face. You like that one. Would you try that one on again? And he said, why? I said, because I want you to have two suits. And the sales guy's like, wow, wish I had an uncle like you, right? Now, I wasn't doing it for the sales guy. I was doing it for my nephew. He ended up with, I think, two suits, maybe three, I forget. And then I said to him, uh, you need shirts with those suits. So make sure he's got at least two different shirts for each suit and ties. I want him to have at least three different ties to go with those three suits and uh, socks. And I looked at my nephew and he's like, uncle, this is uncle. This is, this is way too much. I go, no, it's not. You're a good kid. Good kid. I want you to stay a good kid. I think you should look professional when you go to the office. Cause he had a great job. He got a first job in this kid. This, if I had a job like this kid got out of college. Oh my God. Oh, forget it. And then I said to him, how are you doing on underwear? You need underwear too? I get them to match the suits if you want. He says, well, what good is that? I go, man, the girls see you in the same underwear that matches your suit. Are you kidding? And he laughed at me, but I was making it easy. That's us salespeople. We don't make it difficult. You know, we pretty much know what we want when we walk in. We've already done some of the research. That's amazing. <laughs> well, Megana from India is asking, how can I be more confident about my abilities and knowledge? That's a very good question because it, it comes is a, very good, it is a very lot. Good question. I go out. Go, well, I hope you're ready for this. By going out and proving to yourself that you have the skills and you have the knowledge. Go out and do what you think you can do, so that you know you can do it. Get away. Get out of the thinking thing and do the knowing thing. Now, there's always going to be people who are going to say, well, yeah, I, you know, I don't know how old you are, but, you know, the old thing was you wanted to get a job and somebody said, well, you don't have enough experience. Well, how am I going to get experience? I'm just out of college. I got to get the experience, but I don't have the experience. You want me to have experience, but you won't give me the experience. Um, but you can always get the job. I'm, 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 I'm convinced of that. You've got to, you've got to know how to, you got to get, it's not just enough. I can say to you here, you know what, you've been, been a time when you've been, you know, in a good state of confidence, do that angry, you know, all that. but that's not necessarily going to transfer into you going out and proving to yourself how much you really know. That's not going to happen. Okay. You'd have to remember how to anchor yourself every time first. And that's, you know, all those things. And I'm not into the confidence. I'm not into the confidence without competence thing. I'm into competence to be confident thing. So number one is if you have the skills and you have the knowledge Make sure you have the skills and the knowledge. I'm not, even, I'm not even saying you have to be an expert, but go out and prove to people that you can do it. Very simple. Go out and prove it. First, one of the first jobs I went and interviewed on was bakery thing. Actually, I had worked for a couple of companies before that. They were smaller companies. And, and I sat down with the guy and uh, the plant manager, and he said to me, this is a baking company. This, I mean, we have a large bakery out here with 10 lines of bacon, bread, and stuff. You got any baking experience? I go, actually, I do. I bake bread at home. And he said, well, you know, that's, you know, I, listen, I like your resume. You know, you sound like a nice guy, but baking bread at home is very different than baking bread out there. So why should I hire you not knowing how to bake 
spread what we do. I said, because I don't come here to any preconceived notions. I already understand that. You've hired other guys from other bakeries and they tr turn things around in your business and they do things differently and mess you up. I can't do that because I don't have any way to do it. You're going to be teaching me the way to make your product. And he said, oh, all right. He said, you ever been in a union environment? Worked in a union environment? He said, no, I've worked in worse. He said, what do you mean? I said, I have 45 women working for me, okay? Now, I'm not against all the women, but you know what happens. If one, does, if one doesn't get her way and they start talking to the other ones, it's like a union. They weren't, they weren't unionized. But you know what? It may as well have been because if I've had a problem with one, then they'd all jump in and it was like 45 women against me. So I had to learn to manage them. He said, huh? Wow. Huh. How many? I said, 45. I said, okay. He said, no guys? I said, two. Two guys. And they hid. They, they were hiding. They were always hiding. Because they weren't going to get in problems either with, with the ladies. Ladies were great, by the way. They did a lot of work for me. They liked working for me. They did all that stuff. But man, first time I had a problem with one and I realized this was going to spread around, I said, that's what a union does. So no, you know what? No thanks. I can work in a union because I worked with 45 women. You give me one of your managers who you've already hired that has had to put up with 45 women in one place at the same time. Okay. And I'll put my skills against theirs any day. And he just looked at me and said, huh. Yeah. It's all right. I'm done with the interview. So you know what? I'm gonna, I'll give you a call this afternoon and let you know my decision, which means he already made one. Because if he was going to say no, he would have told personnel to call me and tell me no. He said, I'll call you this afternoon and let you know what I want to do. Good. Get your skills, man, to prove you can do it. Yeah. Prove you can do it. Um, when it comes to the confidence thing, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something else you can do. I never know what the confidence thing or the lack of confidence thing is. But I'm going back to my favorite topic, which is submodalities. For some people who aren't confident, I start to think, I don't have to know what it's about. Whatever it is, see, I'm going to talk about confidence because most people would see me talking to executives, even when I was working in a company. And I was always, I don't want to say friends with them, but I treated them like a peer, like they were my peer. I never thought, oh my God, here comes the vice president. Oh my God, the president's walking around. I go, great, where is he? Hey, Prez, how you doing, man? That's what I did. And I would still do that. So I realized years ago, and this came out of, um, I'll throw something else in here as long because it's all some modalities anyway, as I said in the beginning. It's also to do with, um, let's say, uh, even discrimination. Okay. But the confidence thing first is about this. So if you're not confident when you, I bet, when you think about the situation that you would be in, where you would want to be confident, but you're not, I'm going to guess, number one, it's probably got to do around people. I don't know what position in they're in. I'm going, to, I'm going to assume for the moment that they're above you, and that means the submodalities. So that means whoop, they're up here. They're not your peer. At that? So I've always treated, I don't care who they were. I've, I've, been, I've been called disrespectful to executives when I was working in the company because an executive would ask me a question. I'd give them a straight off the cuff answer because that's me. You ask me a question, I'm going to answer it. I'm not even guaranteeing you're going to like the answer, but that's me. And, and I don't do it to, to give them a hard time. I give them because they ask me a question and I think they deserve an answer to the question. They don't always like the answer to the question. So I treat them as a peer. So if, if, if Natalie asked me a question, I'm going to answer the question to Natalie, right? And I'm going to see Natalie as a peer because I think of them, all my trainers, Michelle, everyone, I think of them as peers of mine. We, we're a team. Oh yeah, I'm, oh, yeah, I'm the president of society. Big deal. Okay? I do not treat any of I don't think I treat any of my trainers like, oh, you're going to do what I tell you to do, damn it. I'm the president of this place, and you're going to blah, 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 blah. I don't think so. I have a wife that can do that for me. She does it to me. She goes, now listen, John, you have to really blah, blah, blah. No, she doesn't really do that. Is, so I never took authorities figures ever and did this and put them above me. And I think I learned that basically because this was probably early childhood programming from my parents, mostly my mom. Don't ever let anybody act like they're above you because you can be better than anybody else, but don't ever try to be better than anybody else just to prove you can. If 
thought, I don't know. You know, I worked, for, I, you know, I went to Catholic school first for about eight years, nine years, right? With the nuns and stuff. And uh, I didn't look at them as, you know, the first one I ever met in the classroom, my first day of kindergarten was Mother Superior came into the room. Okay. Nice little old nun lady, right? And some of the kids stood up. Most of us kept sitting down. And the nun in the class, not the Mother Superior lady, said, what's wrong with you children? When the Mother Superior walks into class, you all stand up. First thing I thought in my head, I was five years old, was why? Why, why should I stand up for this? Uh, and what does Mother Superior mean? Oh, I know. She must be the head of all the nuns because she's superior to the nuns. But this was how my brain was working. And I stood up like everybody else because I was like scared. But the, the other nun hollered at us, you know, and she got that ruler in her hand like this. I think they should put the nuns in charge of this virus. They should, they'll get rid of these, this thing going on. But, um, but, uh, but that's, that's the thing to keep about. Where are the images of what you are not confident in? If you think you have the skills and you think you have the knowledge, you believe you have it, you believe you can use it. That's really, that's really, it's the result. Can you use the skills? You, know, you can't learn NLP from a book. I don't care what anybody says. And you really can't learn it all just online. I keep telling people this. You've got to interact with humans in face to face. That's what it's for. And I, I tell people the same thing. Richard says the same thing. Hey, you know what? I understand you need brain surgery. I just went and read a book in the library. I can do the brain surgery for you. You know, I mean, and, and what are we doing brain surgery? Eh, in a way, in a sense. You know, I wouldn't want to fly with any pilot who only learned on the computer pilot thing, the, the whatever that flight simulator thing. I mean, I, I learned flight. I, I flew around on flight simulator. I reached the expert level. Come on, let's hop on the plane. Yeah, right. Sure. Yeah. You go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll meet you there. So your, your confidence, where is it? You know, where, 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 what's the situation? If you're looking up to it, bring it down here. It sounds kind of simple, but you know what? It's your brain. You're, you're not, not using what you have in your brain. Now, here's the other thing. I, I mentioned discrimination before. I figured out years ago. I worked with I worked with the union. I had 75 union guys working for me. We're talking teamsters. Okay, I got along with the guys great. Now, the guys that were involved in this, and I grew up the way I grew up in a very multi cultural neighborhood, a couple of them actually. The guys that worked for me, I had black guys, white guys, yellow guys, green guys, blue guys, purple guys. I had Catholics, I had Muslims, I had Presbyterians, I had atheists, but you know what? Together, how long? And I talked to them one day, I had a little, little, little meeting, not all 70, they have an uprising. And I had a few, I noticed this, I said, how do you guys get along? What is it? And they would say, well, you know, we're, 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 we're buddies. We're buddies. And they would gesture like this. We're friends. We, we've, worked, we've worked together for years. Okay? Important. I thought, ha, huh. some modalities, very simple. They look at their, they're not worried about the religion. They're not worried about the thing. They don't care if you're a Republican, a Democrat. I don't know if they cared if you were a Democrat or Republican. They chide you a little bit, especially if your guy was in office and they go, I don't know, you voted for that. But they got along. They worked together. They didn't create problems for each other. So the other thing I noticed was a guy, a guy I worked with, he was a supervisor, and he had come to me and said he was quite disturbed. He was a black guy. And we were peers. And he said to me, I don't get it. He said, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not saying I deserve a promotion, but you know, they keep passing over me. And I said, well, have you spoken to them about it? And he said, sure. And I said, well, what do they say? They go, well, you, you need a college degree. You don't have a bachelor's degree. Then you need a master's degree. Then you got to have this. Then you got to go to that. They, he said, I've gone to all these different places. I've done everything they wanted me to do. And I said, who, who, who is the they? Who's the they? And he's, he gave me the manager's name. And I said, he said, I said, look, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna start anything. I'm not, I just want to know who it is. And I observed this guy a few times, this manager guy that kept that time was going, oh no, you yeah, you're a good guy, but you know, you got to go learn this and you got to go learn that, which was all bull. You don't learn anything in college that you're gonna use on your real job, as far as I can tell, unless you're a scientist. 
right? I, I mean, that's as far as I can tell. People ask me, they go, what did you learn in college? I, go, I, learned, how to, I learned how to graduate. You know, my parents wanted to make sure I graduated. I went to college. I graduated. I got an MBA. Why, how to, why'd you do that? I said, because I had nothing to do. I was in Maryland down there for four or five years, and uh, I had a chance to go jump into an MBA program. It was in Maryland, and uh, they just started the MBA program, so they were happy to get people in there because I had so many undergrad cr credits. Um, my MBA, I'm going to make people jealous now. My MBA was all of um, 15 credits. No, 30, 30 credits. So, so all I had to do was 30 credits because of all my undergrad business courses. So I took up space. I learned a couple of little things, right? But I'm, so I'm, but I'm talking to this guy and I said to him, I got him to talk about the union guys. That's what I did. And I say, hey, you know, I got to work with the union guys. He goes, yeah. And he looks down. And I didn't say, I'm not going thinking, oh, is he doing the auditory internal dialogue? Is he doing a kinesthetic thing? What's going on here? And I said, you know, a lot of those guys are really good guys. He goes, yeah, they, they, they probably do a job, good job. You know, some of them, though, you know, some of those people. As soon as he said those people, I realized what was going on. And when he, there were, if there were certain people that he would, in his mind, discriminate against, whether he would verbalize it or not, he looked down on them. Literally looked down on them. He would have all their pictures of them down here. I thought, holy moly. Holy moly. This is, man, this is, what a discovery this is. So whatever your confidence thing is, man, if, you, if you're confident, you know you got the skills and you know you, you know you got the knowledge, prove it. Go out and prove it. As we say, you know, put your stuff on, put your stuff on the line, man. Go put your stuff on the line and go prove it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have one question from Carla from Costa Rica. Based on your business and company's experience, what would you recommend to increase the employee commitment and satisfaction? Employee commitment? Employee commitment and satisfaction. Okay. Hello, Carla. I know who Carla is. Okay. <laughs> um, it's very interesting how to get uh, how to get employee commitment. First of all, they've got to believe in you. Okay. Um, however, you get them to do that. I am, I worked in. A, well, I did my thesis actually. My my master's thesis. I did it on something called long word, but kind of scares people. But that's fun. Uh, it was on socio-technical systems design. And what it meant was, because the companies were doing participative management, this was in the 80s, participative management, that's where the employees supposedly would run the, run the, the business or the place. We tried to do it in one place, and it didn't work all that great. We, got a, we hired some consultants in and whatever. We accidentally sort of accidentally had it installed in another place. That's the place, by the way, where I got it to do the uh, zero lost time accidents. We did it accidentally, sort of. We, in other words, we didn't do it formally. We didn't do it formally. And then we did it formally in another place and that place went crazy boncos, okay? Because when you put the people, the people in charge, that means they get to make the decisions. And then there's minimal management. And then there's, um, there's no status. You know, nobody's better than anybody else. And minimal manage managers, there aren't a lot of managers, only two or three actually. And the plant manager or the head of the, the building, the place. Um, and he's the only one, he can actually pull veto power. In other words, if they make a crazy decision, he can go, no, 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 we're not doing this. That's a very dangerous thing for them to do. So that meant we had to make sure these people were trained, number one, to make decisions, the employees. We had to train them to make the product because this was a brand new place. And we had to make sure the, the, the head of the place knew that anytime he pulled veto power, the entire effort of what they were trying to do there would get dropped down at least 10 notches. So we had to teach them skills in order to facilitate good decision making. So the way to get people to buy in, and it's not money, uh, people think it's money, it's not money. I can talk about that for, tell you how it's, money is not a motivator actually. So the way to get them to do this, 
buy in is they have to have input and true consideration if you're going to ask them what do they think. And so the moment you ask them what do they think, you're asking them for their opinion. Once they give them, once they give you their opinion, my question is, what do you do with it? This is this is a real slippery slope, I'm gonna tell you. It's a very slope. I've had companies ask me if I could put together and do and run for them an employee opinion survey. And I say, can I do it? Sure. Will I do it? No. They go, why not? And my first question is. If you want to do an employee opinion survey, you already know something's wrong. You may not know what's wrong, but you know something's wrong, or you wouldn't want to do an opinion survey. They go, what's wrong with an opinion survey? Go, it's very simple. You're going to do this opinion survey, and you're going to ask them all these questions. You're going to turn, hand out the and they're going to collate all the information. Then what? What are you going to do? They go, well, well then we'll know. I go, big deal. They're not going to know what your, your opinion is of what they told you. They're not going to know if you plan on doing anything about it or not. So if you ask people what they think, just because you want to involve them, but then you're not going to do anything with their opinion, don't waste your time. Run your business. Run your business. You make the decisions and don't involve anybody, and you won't get buy-in unless you're really nice to them. And that's going to be short-term. That means until the next person comes along and wants to pay them more money. Because that's what happens. Did an opinion survey once for the company I was working in at the time. That's what the training tra training guy. And the president said, we're going to do an opinion survey. I just said, they said, why? He said, listen, I already know all your stuff. I already know your bull. I'm going to get back to everybody on the results. I said, really? He said, yes. I said, good or bad, I'm going to answer the question. I'm going to answer them. I said, okay. He said, and you're coming with me because I'm going to travel around to all the plants and every, every office in the country and make sure you can make sure I'm there and answer the questions. I said, fine. And I did. And this guy was great. Everybody, else, you know, he said, you know, you know, we're, we're scared, you know. Yeah, okay, I got that you're scared, the, the, the opinions. Then one question was, I feel safe and secure in my job. It was in the 80s. Things are going like this. I feel safe and secure in my job. And most of them went, no, not really. And when he came time to answer that question, he said, okay, so 90% of you said, you're not, you don't feel safe and secure in your job. He said, 90%, thank you so much. I'm one of them. I don't feel safe and secure in my job and I'm the president of the company. Get used to it, kids. Get used to it. Keep your resume up to date. And I thought that was a great answer. Now, the fallout from that was people going, oh no, we're gonna get fired. He's gonna, he's gonna fire half of us, you know. No, no, that's not what happened. But he, he, he just laid it out right up front. So you wanna get buy-in? And you really got to, you really have to include them. It's got to be heartfelt. It can't be, uh, you know, glossed over kind of stuff. And everybody goes, oh, I love my employees. Yeah, you love your employees. I'm sure you do. Um, I'm sure you like them, but you don't love them enough to give them a piece of the action. And a piece of the action, by the way, isn't always the money. A piece of the action is they buy in when they feel that you're committed to them. I did a whole paper on this. This was, this was a study I did. And when I, when I presented my thesis, by the way, the professor said, this is a really great idea, but I don't think it'll ever work. And I said, that's interesting, Prof, because it's not, it's not, this is not a proposal. This is a case that I've already done three times. And he said, and I can check that out. I said, you want the president of the company's number? He said, sure. And I gave it to him. I don't know if he ever called or not. I said, here, here's his name. Here's his number. Call. He said, wow, you've done this already. I said, yeah, but you're in school here. You're the prof. I got that. You're running an MBA thing. Uh, and you're telling me that you don't think this proposal will work. But your life experience is zero with running manufacturing plants. So, yeah, Carla, you got to you got to think about what you know. What do you do with the employees? How do you treat them? Um, I'm sure you treat them nicely because you know you're you're a nice person. You know you probably you know I don't I don't know you, you know by having having a breakfast party for them or a dinner take them out once in a while. That's not it. That's not it. You know it's it's an everyday thing. It's very, and I'm not saying it's easy to do. If you had to, if you really had to. Think about asking them, so how do you think I could do, what can we do differently here? What can we do differently with this? And they say, well, I think you should change it to X, Y, Z. Um, back when I was doing the thing in the plant, I give it to the employee with the idea and say, here, tell me how it can run. Because I don't know. Make this work for me. Because I don't take problems or, or even, people come to me with problems. Like even when I was in management, people would go, oh, I got a problem. I go, do you bring solutions with it? I don't tell you you have to have those solutions. Do you bring, cho bring choices? No, get out. Get out of my office. Don't you ever bring me a problem again without alternatives? 
I can help you make this decision, but I'm not going to come up with one for you because your problem is not my problem. Okay. Wow. Uh, perhaps because time is almost over. Um, oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so th there is one question that uh, that, that could be Go interesting ahead. now to uh, to to finish uh, really this Good. session. It's from Nidal from France, and he was asking, "What will be the major mental changes after this crisis?" I think that a couple of things are going to be good. Uh, first of all, there's going to be a great sense of relief when people are finally out there and going out and getting back and doing things and walking in the park with their kids and going to the local, you know, dessert shop and ice cream parlor and whatever restaurants and stuff. There's going to be a great relief. So there's going to be a, 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 a better brain chemistry. Let's say that. I think hopefully that people have more of an appreciation for the people that they've been stuck with <laughs> for three months. Wow. And just being able to sneak out and get something to bring back for the, you know, so you can have dinner or whatever. I think there's going to be a greater, I hope there's going to be a greater appreciation for this. I think that when, um, when the kids go back to school, the teachers should prepare themselves for hearing things like, that's not the way my mother taught me to do it. Because um, that's going to happen. Uh, and um, I think people are going to have a, a great appreciation for appreciating really what we have. We're going to appreciate what the things we have. People tend to buy out, they, they want to go out and buy all kinds of stuff. I, I, I'm not into the buy the, buy the stuff stuff. And believe me, I got, I got stuff. Um, I stopped buying stuff a long time ago. Now I only buy the essential things I really need. If I need a new video camera to do things, I'm going to buy a new video camera to do things. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're going to start appreciating the, thing, the things we have. And hopefully... Get rid of stuff need. And I mean that both physically and mentally. Get rid of the stuff we don't need. Uh, I, I, I don't know how well people are going to learn from all of this unless, unless when they're relieved and people say, how did you make that while you were doing this? They say, you know, I, I really learned to appreciate my kids. Bouncing off the walls and everything else. Yeah, a couple of times I wanted to send them to their room, but then I realized they were just kids. And uh, why did I buy a dog at this time? Um, you know, if you already have a dog, by the way, you know, the dog's sitting home going, what are you still doing home? You're, you know, and then the cat, probably the cat's probably sitting there going, I didn't expect them to be here all day long. When do they get, when do they leave? When are they going back to work? So I think people are going to have a different level of appreciation. I also hope, and, and I think some people are going to do this. A lot of people are going to have enough, another appreciation for other people out there. You know, we're, we're doing social distancing, you know, um, I, I know there's going to be a certain part of the population that's probably not going to learn very much at all. You know, when I hear somebody hollering at someone else in the supermarket because their mask isn't on right, you know, it's hanging below their nose. Well, that's none of their business, you know, and stay away from the person. You know, I got to tell you one more. I'm in, a, I'm, in, I'm in the stupid market one day, right? And we put arrows in the aisle. So you had to go down one, arrow, one way and come back the other way. Now they forget something. There's old people. Now you're going to make them walk twice the distance. So if there's something in this aisle, they got to go down this aisle, go all the way around and come back down this aisle to get that one thing they want. And they're older people. They're already, they already got problems with their knees, all this stuff, right? And I do. I got a problem with one knee. So I'm thinking, this is stupid. And I told this to the plant, the, to the store manager. And he said, I, it's a mandate. I go, it's not a mandate. All the stores aren't doing this. Your store's doing this. I'm going down the aisle one day, and I'm going down the right way. And so the other guy comes down the wrong way. And this woman berated him. You know, you're going down the aisle the wrong way. Can't you see the arrows? What's the matter with you? Don't you have respect for anybody? And I'm thinking, I feel sorry for her husband. <laughs> then I'm going down the wrong way one day because I just got tired of going down the right way. I went down. It was, I had to go very far. And this woman's coming down the, other, the right way in her, with, her, with her cart. And then I saw her back up a little bit. Then she came forward again. And, I, and she looked at me. And I thought, oh, sh I better apologize and say, Jim, well, oh, my God, I'm really sorry. I'm, I'm coming down the wrong way. And she looks at me and she says, don't worry about it. She says, I am too. I just walk walking backwards so nobody knows. And I thought, that's adaptation. That's adaptation. I laughed. I laughed. She winked. She goes, yeah. 
She goes, you know, you go down the wrong way, just go backwards because they'll think you missed something and you're still looking for it in the aisle. These are the things I hope happen with people that they start, they start being nice, you know, about these things. You know, these are tough times. There's no, no doubt about it. These are tough times. But you know what? There's food out there. There's water out there. Hey, and there's toilet paper out there. So I don't know what the big deal is. You know, and I, and I thought about the same thing. Why is everybody worried about toilet paper? They're really not going to need it because there's no food. <laughs> but all these things, all these things, I hope, I hope, I really do hope. I, I, I believe in humans. You know, I do. I believe in humans. Uh, I know there's a small percentage of them that, you know, I don't know if, I don't know if there's much that can help them out anyway. I really don't. Um, but I think for most humans, they're going to, they're going to come out with some epiphanies and some, uh, some real learning things. And, uh, and that could be better for the entire, uh, the entire planet, actually. You know, I'm, I'm certain, I'm certainly hoping so. So. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much. I want to thank you precious that was really precious um there are so many other questions but we will i know i, know, I could go yeah. for two weeks yeah we, we actually we will keep answering the questions you know with regular videos perhaps sometime we'll, we'll do another session with you if you if you sure. wish yeah I and come back. so thank you so much it was amazing information uh thank you thank you to all of you who watched already the video all those who are going to watch also the replay because most of the french speaking people are waiting for the replay with the translations so uh, that'll be good yeah so that will be good thank you natalie and thank you, Michel. Thank, Michel. you. And and thank you and bye thank, thank you for everybody for putting up with me <laughs> thank you to every one of you so don't uh, don't forget subscribe to the channel we'll have a lot of new contents all content driven we are not selling things here it's just about giving you content do and yourself coming. yeah and richard is coming in a, a few days so the 25th so in nine days so do yourself good and see you soon thank you again